Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Good to be together. And uh, it's nice to have a couple of people in our presence rather than just being online. We've got Alex all the way from, well, it's Algiers, Germany, UK. It's all the way from around the world. Here's Alex with us. Good to be. And Thomas has joined us again today. And uh, for those that are online, you're seeing a different backing. We've, we've changed the layout so that I'm not doing this, you know, <laughs> looking right. Um, and uh, so hopefully it'll feel like I'm engaging with you guys as well as we look at our current family here. Maybe, which we haven't done for a while, I'm just going to do a quick fly around <laughs> of everybody. So I'll take the camera. I'm just going to say shalom, everybody. How long do you want me to be on you, Ian? <laughs> But glary there. There we go. And there's all at the back. There we go. Hello. Okie dokie. Get it back. Hey, just for our family online to see your smiling faces. It's good that we can be together. Carol's saying Shabbat Shalom, family. It's good for us to gather in Yahweh's household, be together in unity, and may we rejoice and be glad in Yahweh's favor and loving commitment. So we praise our master that we can have the ability to connect, especially with those who are unable to physically be together, but we can be together in our master's presence, delighting ourselves in him and allowing his spirit to teach us and guide us. And so we're carrying on with Shemot. Uh, and it's also, i also just say it's nice to have Patrick here. Yeah, he's he's, he's uh, been at home for the past few weeks, uh, been a bit under the weather, so he's feeling a bit more charged up. Ready to read again, I'm sure. Patrick, are you ready for reading again today? Yes. Good, good. So we, we praise Yahweh that he puts his hand of healing upon you and continues to strengthen you. So we're going to read from Shemot 35, verse 1 to 38, 20 today. So Patrick's ready. He's been fired up and waiting to read again. So, <laughs> Hey, Pat. And Moshe assembled all the congregation of the children of Israel, and said to them, These are the words which Yahweh has commanded you to do. Work is done for six days, but on the seventh day it shall be set apart to you. A Sabbath of rest to Yahweh. Anyone doing work on it is put to death. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. And Moshe spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the word which Yahweh commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to Yahweh. Everyone whose heart is so moves him, let him bring it as a contribution to Yahweh. Gold, silver, <clears throat> and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet material, and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skin dyed red, and, and fine leather and acacia wood, and oil for the lamps, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, and shoham stones and stones to be set in the shoulder garment and in the breastplate. And let all the wise hearted among you come and make all that Yahweh has commanded. <clears throat> The dwelling place, its tent, its coverings, its hooks, its boards, its bars, its columns, and its sockets. The ark and the poles, the lid of atonement, and the veil of the covering. The table and the poles and all the utensils and the showbread. And the lampstand for the light and its utensils and its lamps and oil for the light. And the, and the incense slaughter place and its poles and the anointing oil and sweet incense and covering for the door at the entrance of the dwelling place. The slaughter place of ascending offering with its bronze grating, its poles and at all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the screens of the courtyard, its columns and its sockets, and the covering of the gate of the courtyard, the pegs of the dwelling place, and the pegs of the courtyard, and their cords, <clears throat> the woven garments to, to do service 
in the set apart place and the set apart garments for Aharon the priest and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. And all the congregation of the children of Israel withdrew from the presence of Moshe. And everyone whose heart lifted him up and everyone whose spirit moved him came and they brought the contribution to Yahweh for the work of the tent of appointment and for all the service and for all the set-apart garments. <clears throat> and they came, both men and women, all whose hearts moved them and brought earrings, nose rings and rings and bracelets and all golden goods. Even every one who made a wave offering of gold to Yahweh. And every man with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet material, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and, the, and fine leather wrought them. And everyone would make a contribution to Yahweh of silver or bronze brought it, and everyone with whom was found acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the, the wise-hearted women spun yarns with their hands and brought what they had spun, blue, purple, and scarlet material and, and fine linen. And the woman whose hearts lifted them up in wisdom spun the goat's hair. And the rulers brought showham stones and the stones to be set in the shoulder garments and in the breastplate and the spice and the oil for the light, and for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. And the children of Israel brought voluntary offerings to Yahweh, all the men and women whose hearts moved them to bring all kinds of work which Yahweh by the hand of Moshe had commanded to be done. And Moshe said to the children of Israel, See, Yahweh has called by name Betzalel, son of Uri, son of Chir, of the tribe of Yehuda, and he has filled him with the spirit of wisdom in wisdom, spirit of Elohim in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all work, to make designs to work in gold and in silver and in bronze, and in cutting of stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in all, in all workmanship or, or design. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach. In him a holy love, son of Abismarck of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do the work of the engraver and the designer an embroiderer in blue, in purple, and in scarlet material, and in fine linen, and a weaver doing any work, and makers of designs. Okay, so this week's Torah portion is called Vayakal, which means, and he assembles. And it comes from the root word uh, for assemble, it comes from the root word kahal, which actually means an assembly or to gather as an assembly or congregation. And this is the word that we typically hear whenever speaking of an assembly of people who gather for the Shabbat and feast days of Yahweh, known as the kahal. Okay, and that's also why from the root word ecclesiastes, which is the Greek ecclesia, um, the Hebrew word kohelet, means the gatherer, the one who actually gathers the assembling of the people. You know, and so one of the reactions that tends to happen when we come to this Torah portion is, hold on, but we've done this already. You know, why are we doing this all over again? And what we have to take note of 
It sounds like repetition, especially over the last couple of Torah portions. The last couple of weeks, we've been reading about blue, scarlet, fine leather, acacia wood, oils, spices, everything of, of that, you know. And it's like, what's going on here? But what we have to see is this isn't just a repetition of instructions. What we see in this Torah portion is the instructions being lived out. Because what Yahweh did, Yahweh gave Moshe the instructions. Then Moshe gave the elders the instructions, etc. Now we see Betzal al Nuhuliyah starting to get, we see the response of the people firstly bringing everything that's required. Then we see Betzal al Nuhuliyah who have been appointed as, as those and the others wise hearted that actually now f- carry out the clear instructions that was given from Yahweh to Moshe, from Moshe to the people. So this is, uh, this is basically where the drawing becomes the reality, so to speak. This is where the instructions get done. It's, it's no longer just about what Yahweh says, but rather about we are to be doing what Yahweh says. And that's what we see in these Torah portions. This Torah portion is a historical account of these events teaching us a valuable lesson that we cannot just be hearers only. We need to be doers of the word. But you can't also be doing something you haven't heard the instructions of, you know. And so it's no longer just about... Yahweh's saying it, and it's like, oh, I've heard about that. This is actively taking into account the very clear instructions that we've been speaking a lot about, having ears to hear, paying attention to what must be done so that you do it correctly according to the pattern. One of the themes right through Shemot is about following the pattern. That can be kind of like the, the critical lesson that we take above Obviously, above that is the name, Yahweh, that's revealed. It gives us an identity of whose pattern we follow. Because if you don't know the name of your creator and your savior, how do, can you follow him? How can you know him? How can you follow his pattern? And there's a lot, there's a lot of counterfeit patterns out there, you know. And so as we go through this um, Torah portion, one of the things that we take note of, while it sounds like repetition, one of the things that we as sinful beings in the flesh need to do is we need to repeat matters so that we don't forget them, you know. And we have to understand that through, te- through repetition, we establish to memory. It's like anything in life. You know, we always use the, you know, for those that are, have all got their driver's license now, we always use that uh, a lesson that when you were learning to drive, it was a panic. So, uh, you know, I remember my oldest daughter going around the block and halfway around, she stopped the car and she got out and walked home. You know, I'm not driving, you know, <laughs> because I'll never get this. But today it's like second nature because it's repetition, not giving up but just pushing through. And it's a, that's an application or a lesson that we take through in learning how to walk in our master too. You know, for though a righteous one falls seven times, he gets up. Now that's not an excuse or a license to fall purposefully because hopefully you don't make yourself fall, you know. You tend to fall sometimes because you maybe took a step out of joint because whatever. And, and as you get up, you dust your feet and you go forward. And it's through repetition of practice from the instructions that are given, that you actually become skilled or a skilled workman is what we're reading about in this Torah portion too. It's about the the wisdom that's given and the skill that's given to do the work according to the design. And that's why every single week we listen to Moshe, we hear what he's saying, we hear the prophets calling us back, we read the renewed writings of the revelation of why we are called back and what pattern we are called to so that we can become skilled workmen and present ourselves as workmen approved before the master, knowing how to rightly handle the word of truth and being able to discern between the clean and the unclean, between the set apart and the profane. So as we go through this Torah portion, we, we find a great lesson in how the words that we hear are to put, be put into practice. In other words, it's not just for a, set, you know, a, a select number of people. Yahweh's word is for every single one of us to be putting into practice, to be living it out actively every single day. And so when we see this Torah portion starting with, and Moshe gathered the people, or you know, he assembled the congregation, this is a powerful thing here because we, we see how after having seen Moshe's face shining, I mean, remember, they couldn't look at his face anymore. And then he had to put a veil over his face. When he would go into the master, he would receive instructions. He'd speak to them. And once he'd spoken the truth, he'd put a veil over his face again. So it showed a clear witness that this Moshe, that they argued and rebelled and still would rebel in the future. I mean, people don't learn lessons when they walk according to the flesh. But this Moshe, who they questioned, who made you a judge and ruler over us, was the one that they were to be listening to because it was made clear that this is the one that Yahweh chose. Mm -hmm. You know? And so... We see how 
when they were unable to look at his face when it was shining, they now clearly have a recognizable authority that they have to listen to, you know, in the, in, in the man Moshe that was here. And now his position of authority was clearly established, and therefore he is the one that assembles the people. And Moshe calls them together in once again to go over the commands that Yahweh had given him. And the Greek word that's used here for uh, assembled is sunathroizo, which means to gather together or gather, uh, um, be gathered together. Coming from two words, um, it's a primary preposition of sun, which means with or together or expresses an association with others or being in a company or a companion of others. And then athroizo, which means to hoard or gather together. In other words, it's being with those that are coming together. It's, it speaks of a unity. We're all coming together for a common purpose, a common goal. And the Greek word that's used in the Septuagint of this um, chapter for congregation is the word synagogue, obviously where we get the term synagogue from. So synagogue is not a Hebrew-rooted word, just so by the way. So, you know, all the Jews that are going to synagogues, it's, a, it's, a, it's from a Greek word, synagogue, okay? Mm. And it means a bringing together or an assembling and it comes um, from the, the verb sunago, which means to assemble or to gather. And so coming again from the preposition sun and ago, which means to lead, bring or carry. So together we lead each other to, to gather. That's the concept behind it, you know. And so another Greek equivalent, as I mentioned, the book of Kohelet in the Greek is known as ecclesia because that's another, another Greek word that's used to define an assembling or gathering of people. Um, ecclesia means assembly or congregation, coming from ek, which means from or from, out of or belonging to, and kaleo, which means to call out or called out or to invite or summonsed. So again, it's a calling out of the gathering of the called out ones. The, those that have ears to hear, they get together and they gather. That's the ecclesia. And so we see a reference to a called out invited people being summonsed by his name by him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the privilege that we get every single week on the Shabbat. So when we speak of kahal or ecclesia, in the scriptural context, we take note that it's speaking of the body or the bride of Messiah. Hmm. You know, And a called out chosen people who we are in him, known as Yisrael, to rule with our, you know, being grafted in to, by the blood of Messiah, enabled and equipped because of his blood, that once we were not a people of Elohim, now we are the people of Elohim. And that should be enough revelation in itself to not neglect the gathering of the set-apart ones, as is the habit of some. And so neither kahal or ecclesia means a building. It's very important for us to understand that, you know, and the purpose for me highlighting this is that what we see being called for in Scripture in regards to our necessary gathering or assembling as a group of people at the appointed times, which includes every Shabbat, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a kind of, how can I say, it? it's a responsibility for all of us to be encouraging one another. As we see every Shabbat drawing near, as we see every appointment of, of Yahweh drawing near, I mean, I hope all of you are already starting to get excited for Sukkot. You know, we've just entered the fifth month, third of the fifth, third of the fifth today. And so we just uh, just over two months' time, we'll be we'll be, you know, hope, well, hopefully we'll all be ready to gear up, get our tent pegs together, and ready to hit them in the ground and dwell in the in the wonderful nature that our master gives us every year to be with him and dwell with him, you know. And so this is part of the gathering. This is what it ultimately looks forward to, because the as we know, Sukkot is uh, is kind of like a reflection of the wedding feast, the culmination of the completion of the cyclical events of everything, that the work that our master has begun in us and will bring to completion. So when we don't start out right and don't continue right, how can we finish right? So that's why every Shabbat, every appointed time is critical in the cyclical rehearsal that we get to do so that when we do come to Sukkot, while it's commanded to rejoice, it's a natural expression of our thanksgiving for our master. It's not even a negotiable. We naturally rejoice, you know. And so we need to hold fast our confession with expectation, you know, and without yielding, 
We, we hold fast that which we have in our master without yielding. In other words, we don't break our master's commands and because we know that what he's promised us, what he's instructed to us is a trustworthy word. It's a trustworthy thing that we can take. And therefore, that should cause us to be concerned with each other, to, to call each other, say, don't neglect the gathering. Let's be together because we feed off each other's joy and excitement in our master too, you know. And so we, we see a very valuable lesson for us today in teaching us that even our master kind of gave this lesson to his taught ones when they marveled about the, the, t- the temple, the dwelling place, and its stones and its architecture. I mean, it had to have been something spectacular to look at. Listen, that was uh, uh, um, rebuilt after a bit of destruction. It was repaired. But, you know, from the, from the, the how can I say, from the foundations of what Shalomo had built and the, the wisdom that Yahweh gave Shalomo and the builders and brought together, it was spectacular because it's according to Yahweh's pattern. When the taught ones were looking at this, they were marveling. He says, don't marvel at this. Not one stone will be left unturned, you know, and he will tear it down and he will raise it up in three days. And he says he was speaking about his body and this caused an uproar. This took over 40 years to build. How do you say you're going to raise it in three days? And he was speaking about us, his body, in the resurrection that he would bring. Now, all of these things that we see as we read the book of Hebrews a bit later teach us a valuable lesson why we learn the pattern because it was a shadow picture of the coming good matters. So if we want to understand who we are in the master, we need the pattern rehearsed repetitively in our lives every single week so that we can know who we are and why we gather, you know. And so point, the point that I'm trying to make here is that we as a called out, chosen, set apart nation of the master, we see here that when Moshe assembled the people, we have to realize that nowhere in scripture or nowhere uh, uh, this is what we see is when, when there's a calling out of people, what we see this calling out on the appointed times of Yahweh and his Sabbaths, we see that the counterfeit patterns that I've been talking about, we see nowhere a picture of a church meeting or reference to a church being described in Scripture. I was mentioning to Jan and Melinda the other day that, you know, you know the King James, many people think, and probably most, have you thought it as well that the King James was the first English translation? But it wasn't. It certainly was the first uh, English Catholic translation, okay? But a hundred years or so before that, you had Tyndale's translation, and he was held as a heretic for speaking out against the Catholic Church, you know? And in Tyndale's translation, which is, if you try and read it, it's, you know, the English changed a lot over the centuries. You know, it's like trying to read a Shakespeare play. But he only used the church twice in the book of Acts in regards to pagan temples. So the English word church, too, doesn't describe the kahal or ecclesia of Yahweh. It's important for us to understand that because of the things that we've come out from, we naturally have the singing. It was like the taught ones of the day. Look at this place. But it's not about the place. And so even in the English, when we see church, we don't use the word church because it doesn't describe Messiah's body. What it does picture for us is a counterfeit pattern of man-made theologies that have built up their own stones and procedures to manipulate and control, as opposed to equip and set free in the freedom of the Torah that guides and leads each and every person. And so when you refuse to gather and assemble together, and hear that which you as a believer are commanded to do, then you can never be equipped to faithfully serve our master in spirit and in truth as the tabernacle. And every Shabbat, as we assemble, we are commanded in Vayikra 23 that it is a set-apart gathering. All the Sabbaths of Yahweh are called out set-apart gatherings. And this is how we begin to learn and grow in the instructions of Yahweh, you know, so that we can guard to do them. And the very first matter that Moshe speaks to this assembly is the guarding of the Sabbath. Six days' work is done, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath must be kept. And that's what brings order out of chaos in our lives. Mm. When we continue to keep that as the cornerstone, as that which ends and begins everything that we do, because if you think about it, we look forward to the Shabbat. After the Shabbat, we're ready to go out and do our work, and we look forward to that refreshing rest again to continue working. Mm. Without the Shabbat... You'll burn out over time. 
you know. And anyone who claims to be building the kingdom of our master yet does not remember to keep the Sabbath is only deceiving themselves. Mm. In other words, they are hearers only and not doers deceiving themselves, as Yaakov says, you know. And so while it might sound repetitive, what we see is we've discussed it many times right through the Torah portion, and you're going to hear it cyclically over and over again until our master comes because it's important because the Sabbath is a mark of our existence. It's a mark of our identity because it marks us as being a people that Yahweh has called out of darkness and set apart, that it is he who sets us apart. So our observance of Sabbath correctly shows that we are allowing him to set us apart according to his word, and we're not doing what's right in our own eyes, you know. And so one of the things that we take note of here is that the, the Hebrew word that's used for work in, in this verse 2 of this chapter that we've just read is melacha, which means occupation, work, business, craftsmanship, and comes, from, uh, and, and comes from the same word as malach, and that malach, uh, uh, which also comes from the word to work, or to, it means a messenger or an ambassador or an envoy, you know. And the Hebrew word that's used for no work is done is asa, which is to do. In fact, the book of Acts, ma'ase, is the works of the emissaries that's recorded for us, you know. And it's very clear, I'm sure, death means death. The one who breaks the Sabbath is put to death, you know. In the Master we have life. The Torah is about life. Mm. And we are to choose life or death, you know. Our Master gives us a choice. He encourages us to choose life, but he gives it to you, you know. And so it's clear, do not work on the Sabbath. That is, you do not do your normal occupational work that you do the other six days on the Sabbath. There was work that was done on the Sabbath. There were slaughterings that were done. There were offerings, double offerings that were, that were offered up on a Shabbat. And if the Shabbat happened to fall on a new moon, it was even more offerings, you know. So there certainly was work at the slaughter place that was being done in service of causing people to draw near to Yahweh's presence. But what this is speaking of is that the occupational uh, work of one that, one that did every other day of the week was not to be done on the Shabbat. There were people appointed for gathering wood, and you need a lot of wood for the fires in the tabernacle. There were people that would actually have to do a lot of work in preparation. They wouldn't do that on the Shabbat because it would be there on the Shabbat ready to be used, you know. And so what we see here is do not be found doing your own weekly work and doings. In fact, Yeshiyahu 58 sets a standard for us in making sure that even on the Shabbat, we don't speak our own words. We don't think our own thoughts, you know. We call it a set-apart day, a delight, and we delight ourselves in it, not doing our own ways nor finding our own pleasures. This is a very valuable lesson because a lot of people think, well, I'm not at work today, so I can, you know, uh, um, go out and do some pleasurable things, you know. And this is, it's not... Often people look at this and think, oh, you're making Shabbat sound all, mm, and it's not pleasurable. No, when we delight in what our master delights in, we find that the Shabbat becomes very pleasurable. And how freeing is it when we can throw off everything of this world that we've been walking in the midst of and delight ourselves together as an assembly in the master, you know? And so... When we see here, in, in, it's in Yeshiyahu 58, verse 13 to 14, where he talks, not speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the master. So again, it's not like we, oh, am I not allowed to talk? No, what it means is you don't go off into discussions that, you know, are rabbit trails away from focus of the master. Think about it like this. This is our date with him as a bride with her husband. Now, can you imagine having a date with your loved one, which... I hope you can imagine well, because that's what we're doing right here, right now. But can you imagine that you're having this and your focus should be on your loved one, but then you go off and you start, your mind wanders onto junk. That's what we are guard, to guard against, you know. And so another aspect, the seventh day is to be set apart from us. And what we see here, we also see on the seventh day as we cease from that um, which we continue to do every other day of the week as a bride that comes together. We're immersed in the presence of our king. We're refreshed in his word that gives us life, equipping us to keep going on. And so when we understand this concept here, we also understand that um, when we see that this word is uh, coming from the same root from which we get the word for a messenger or an uh, envoy or an ambassador, then we also see that the Shabbat is not a day when we're going out 
to be a messenger to those that don't know the master. This is for the house to come together. The rest of the six days, we have our talents and gifts in the occupation that we're doing, but it's to shine the light of our master's truth in everything that we do so that we become ambassadors of his reign and the ambassador represents the reign which is to come by guarding his word. And when we come together, we're not ambassadors of his reign. In a, we are, but when we're coming together, we're not, we're not reaching each other to get into the reign. We're celebrating that the reign that we've been called into and we delight ourselves in him. So it's also not the day, it's not a day to be reaching out to others. That goes for his feasts as well. We learned that very quickly in our first Pesach over a decade ago when we had people that weren't on this walk having the Pesach meal very quickly learned that if you are not immersed in the master and walking in this word, you don't have Pesach meal. You know, you, coming from a wrong mindset, you think, oh, it's an, op it's an opportunity to reach out. No, Yahweh's appointed times is for his bride. Those that are in his presence have, always, have already been reached out to and already part of, you know. And so we see a powerful picture. Uh, um, you can look in the notes. I've done, uh, uh, just given some insight of to where the concept of church uh, uh, comes from and, and the roots that are in. And that's why we prefer to say ecclesia or kahal or assembly um, in referring to our gathering and our master of who we are. And so what 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 is a powerful reality here is how Yahweh assembles or gathers his people together. And, and when people say, well, how does he do this? The answer is very clear. Moshe assembled. And just that mindset change has to come into people's lives in order to understand that which unlocks a great revelation of who our master is, you know. Acts 15, verse 21, this was when the nations were wanting to, you know, come and also be part of this. And you had the Yehudim that were enforcing physical circumcision and saying you're not keeping the Torah and against Shaul, and they brought a back report. Shaul and Barnabas brought back wonderful reports of what how the word was spreading in Asia, you know, and, and modern-day Turkey, if you will, and how this was a growing thing. And, and But those that were chasing hard after Shaul to put his word to naught were, were confusing a lot of the people. And the nation was saying, what must we do? And they, they wrote letters to say, well, you do well if you stop these few things. Stop whoring, drinking blood, strangled animals, or, or um, what's the fourth one? Can't think. Whoring, strangled animals, blood, or offering to idols, idol worship. So when we see, and it says in verse 21 after that, he says, and from ancient generations, Moshe has in every city those proclaiming him, being read in the congregation every Shabbat. Every Shabbat we assemble as commanded in Vayikra 23, as a set-apart gathering, and Moshe is read. And this is where we learn the pattern. This is where we learn how to grow in the instructions of our master, hear his commands, and God to do them. So we as the body assemble, and it's very important, when you assemble and you gather together, it's for the purpose of hearing Yahweh's instructions so that we can make sure that we're a proper ambassador when we're out in the world, you know. And so one of the things that we take note of is we've mentioned many times, there are many groups gathering together today, and because they think they've heard the pattern once, they don't listen to Moshe anymore. There's nothing wrong with taking topical teachings and expressing them, you know, and going, we, we go into the writings, we go into the renewed writings. In the week, I'll send out messengers, messages. There's nothing wrong with t digging in in all scripture because it's all there to teach us, to train us, to reprove us, to correct us, to build us up. But if Moshe is, not, is being neglected on a Shabbat, it's not according to the pattern, you know. And so we need to understand the joy that we have in our master and the importance that his Sabbath brings to us and the joy that it brings in strengthening us. And you can understand why the enemy would try and redirect your thoughts or redirect your emotions and your, your actions away from delighting yourself in the Shabbat, you know. Verse 3 says, do not kindle a fire on the Shabbat. This was, this was a literal command, especially we know there were slaughterings going on in the slaughter place and the fire had to be burning. We also know that the lamp had to get trimmed every morning and evening and there was oil that was brought so that there was continual light before the showbread table. And it was on the Shabbat that the showbread would be replaced. 
But what we take note of here is obviously in individual dwellings, this requirement of starting a fire in the ancient times would, practi would be a practical thing of causing people to work. You know, especially in the building process, because now we're dealing with Yahweh's building, bringing everything together that the people need. But what takes precedence over building is Yahweh's Shabbat. Mm. And that's why he's mentioned this first. He says, yes, we're about to build this tabernacle, but you don't do any work for it on the Shabbat. You know? Mm. And so we see a, a, um, the Hebrew word for kindle, ba'ar, means to burn, kindle, consume, or destroy. And what we see here is that we see this lesson teaching us a valuable one as a spiritual house that offers up spiritual slaughter offerings of praise to our master. When Yaakov tells us that the tongue is this little member, the book of James in chapter 3, he tells us where you see it sets on fire. It kindles huge fires and sets on fire like blazes you know and he says this little member like a little rudder on a ship that directs a huge ship and he says with it we bless Elohim and we curse man it should not be so and so when we understand this concept we also understand look as we see from Yeshia 58 you know not thinking your own thoughts or speaking your own words Shabbat's not the time to come in and be a know-it-all it's not the time to come in and think you can win an argument it's not the time to come in and be debating and reasoning now we should never really be fighting with our tongue Okay, we should learn to control our tongue. That's what Yaakov teaches us. Be slow to anger, you know, quick to hear, slow to anger, slow to speak. Because often it's normally when we react to something that we maybe don't understand fully, we don't agree with, that's what starts a fire. And then negativity and everything fuels that fire. And so when we come in with wrong attitudes on a Shabbat, we might just be like a match that's about to be ignited if we say the wrong thing, you know. And it's, as I'll just read from uh, Yaakov, it says, the tongue is a little member yet boasts greatly. See how little fire kindles a great forest. And the tongue is a fire, the world of unrighteousness. Among our members, the tongue is set, the one defiling the entire body and setting on fire the wheel of life. And it is set on fire by Gehenna. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by man mankind. But no man is able to tame the tongue. It is unruly, evil, filled with deadly poison. I mean, it's, you think about this, it's, it's the world of unrighteousness. Our master said, out of the overflow of a heart, so a man speaks. The bad in the man's heart will come out in his speech. The good in a man's heart will come out in his speech. You will recognize people where they're at in their lives by what they say. And even on a Shabbat, because when you gather together, you'll know what's going on in someone's life by their, their mannerism, their attitude, their words. Now, if you're trying to put on a show on a Shabbat, it will also come out. Because that's another aspect of not kindling a fire on Shabbat. Because kindling a fire or would, causing a fire to keep burning, you need kindling to keep fire burning so you can put bigger pieces on so that you can bring the proper offering and let it be burnt whole up to the master. That's a practical thing. So thinking about it like this, if you haven't been keeping the fire burning the rest of the week, because one of the lessons that we've learned as we've been going through the pattern and the command to bring oil was a command for everybody so that the lamps burn continually, tamid, which is it doesn't stop, it teaches us a valuable lesson that as light of our master, we don't turn off the light. We don't hide the light. But if you haven't been shining the light of that truth in everything that you say and do in the six days that you are to be working unto the master, you can't come and think that you can quickly light a fire of his presence in your life on Shabbat. You know, it's not a time to come and put on a show and act like you've been walking in the Torah, but quickly lighting the fire and trying to speak all the right words and worship that would make one look spiritual. Because, you know, we came out of a hypo hypocri what, hi hypocritical, that, that horrible system. That's exactly what people did, you know, in their corrupt way. Our lamps are to be burning continually, and it's on the Sabbath when we get to bring our lamps collectively together and let the light of his truth bring further encouragement and refreshing to a people that are girded about with his truth, you know. And then Moshe spoke, and it's a, a wonderful verse again that solidifies how important it is for the Torah of Yahweh that 
we receive his commands through the words that Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Moshe wrote down, which we go through every week, which we're doing now. And one of the patterns that we see in scripture, especially in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, when they were rebuilding the ruins, when they came back from captivity and they started rebuilding and each one had to build, as you, some of you have been through the message I sent out this week, you know, and how you had to build your section of the wall. You must build, you must be responsible for your part of the wall and it all comes together in unity. But also at that time when Ezra, the scribe, read from the Torah on Yom Teruah, the very first time that they'd heard the Torah for many years, some of them had never heard it, you know. And then it was confusing at first for some. I don't understand this. But then there were those that were appointed to bring understanding and to expand and to bring clarity. So this is what we do every week. We read the word and then we expand and we bring clarity to it. So we're not adding or taking away. We see those that have been appointed to equip, to teach, to bring clarity and understanding so that people can understand and do the word correctly, you know. But if what makes it harder to receive and understand is if you haven't been guarding that which you ought to because you had ears to hear, but if you didn't have ears to hear and you go out in the week, you aren't doing what the word says. You come in, you try and kindle a fire quickly. It, it, you know what? Yahweh sees right through it. You might be able to put on a show before man, but Yahweh sees right through it. And this is what we are to guard against as one of the things of not kindling a fire on Shabbat. And having ears to hear, Mishle warns us very clearly. Shalomo says in his wisdom of his parables that he gave us in 28 verse 9, he who turns away his ear from hearing the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. So why is it that there's this pattern today of coming together on a Shabbat, but no, 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 we don't do Torah. So by their own actions, they are turning their ear away from hearing the Torah. Then they want to make their long-winded prayers and expect Yahweh to jump at their requests. But they are no more and nothing more than an abomination in the ears of Yahweh. Once again, when when is the Torah heard by the assembly? Every Shabbat. And that's a pattern that we have no authority to change. You know, that's what Yahweh commanded. And commanded doesn't mean suggested or requested, but commanded. You know, and so we see a very powerful witness here of the importance of the Shabbat that Moshe is giving us and how we need to understand and I know I'm sounding repetitive but it's for good reason because in the building which we are we're building one another up in the set apart belief mm. if you don't get Shabbat right you'll never get the building process right it's fine. and so when we go through this Torah portion I suppose we don't need to go in depth into things unless there's any questions that some have but in understanding the concept of um, what we have here with the gold and the silver and the purple material, the scarlet, the fine leather, the fine linen, the acacia wood, the oil for the uh, uh, lamps, the spices for the incense, you know, all of these things representing, as we went through last week, we, re we see the powerful picture of being built up in the master and how each part speaks of either redemption or being secured or being cleansed or being clothed in righteousness, being called out of darkness, being set apart to shine the light, you know, and so when we understand the design and the necessity for everyone to bring what was required, we see that if you didn't have ears to hear, how would you know what to bring on your part? And when people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, what's my part? Well, start having ears to hear. And as you learn the pattern, you see the people brought, one of the nice things that we read in this chapter, it tells us that those who had acacia wood brought, those that had this brought, out of their own voluntary offering that was brought. Yahweh put it into their hands when they plundered Mitzrayim, when they left, you know. And it was still, this is how Yahweh says, I'll put into your hands, into your life, that which I require of you, but it's up to you to want to bring it to me, you know. And so this is a wonderful thing here. And we see that it's only after being called out of darkness and listening to his instructions and starting to guard to do what he says that one begins to understand as the wisdom from above gets enacted in one's life by the spirit of Elohim that you begin to see, okay, this is actually, this is what I can do. This is what I can bring, you know. Yahweh's not going to expect something of you that he hasn't put in your life. You know, those that didn't have acacia wood, it was never expected of them to bring. So when they're seeing others, they said, well, I can't bring that. No, but what's in your hand? Mm. 
What is in your life? What part can you bring to encourage, to, you know, to comfort, to strengthen, to build up? And all of these being brought together brings about the perfection of a dwelling place where Yahweh's presence can dwell. So it's important as we understand and recap all these things, the blue, you know, represents again why we wear tzitzits. And I'll say it again, you know, it's not just, oh, here's a command. It's a joy for us to be wearing that which has in our tassels a blue thread reminding us of the command so that we don't rebel. Numbers 15 clearly tells us that we wear tzitzits or blue, uh, with blue in it so that we don't rebel against the commands. Now you can wear your tzitzits and still be rebelling. That's a misrepresentation of Yahweh. That's not being a proper ambassador. You know, the, the Yehudim or the, the religious Pharisees, they didn't put blue in their tzitzits and they made their tassels very long because they wanted to be on show. But they were not listening to the commands and not representing Yahweh correctly. So we see a very powerful thing is, again, there are a couple of things on an outward expression that we see in our lives, like wearing tzitzits, you know, like clear instruction. Men don't wear what's fitting for a woman and women don't wear what's fitting for a man. I mean, we could go through the entire Torah here and what's clear. as, But there are outward expressions. We don't destroy our beards. We don't destroy that as a, a, a on our face. And it's one of the things, and we also see when you're listening to somebody teaching, if they are wearing a head covering while teaching, because it's a form of prophesying or praying, because it's either speaking to or praying about Yahweh, or uh, um, speaking about Yahweh, a man shouldn't have his head covered. Talits are not scriptural. Read my article on that if you're not sure what I mean by that, mm. you know. So there are some outward expressions that we can start to identify as either clear ticks or red flags. And when, when a, a teacher is coming and they're deliberately shaving their head, you don't listen to them. In fact, there are many on this Torah walk that are listening to a Karite Jew that doesn't confess Messiah. He shaves his head and he's pre presenting a false pronunciation of the name of Yahweh. And people are listening to him. I'm not going to go into names and everything else. I'm just guarding, telling you to guard yourself against being led astray by things that don't represent the correct pattern, you know. And so that's what all these elements begin to teach us, you know. As we just went through it last week. I don't know, does anybody want to ask any questions about all these elements or does it make sense? Uh, should still be fresh in your mind, you know. Who'd like to speak about the the oils or the... Coverings that are there, or are we all good about that? It represents our, our covering that we have in our master, the anointing that we receive by his spirit, and the responsibility of keeping our garments clean and, and without spot or blemish by guarding his word. You know, when we increase learning and delight in understanding the truth because we do what the truth says, because we have had ears to hear, meditating on the Torah of Elohim, then we can understand that um, we delight in that understanding. How many of you, when you see something new in the word, it's like you, you actually get excited because the understanding is like, oh, is that what it means? It's like, wow. Mishle 18 says a fool does not delight in understanding, but in uncovering his own heart, 18 verse 2. In other words, fools don't want to, they don't care about gathering because they don't care what the word says. They don't care about something that they might learn. And you'll only learn and grow in understanding if you actually do what you're hearing, you know. And Shemot 28 verse 3, when, and he said, you'll speak to all the wise of heart who I have filled with the spirit of wisdom and they shall make the gar garments for Aharon to set him apart for him to serve as priest to me. And so here we again see that was the instruction given in 28. Here in this chapter we see, in this Torah portion, we see those instructions being lived out. And that's why it sounds repetitive because the instructions were lived out perfectly. It, there was no deviation from Yahweh's instructions. And that's one of the main things that we, we take from this. You know, anybody want to share their thoughts on this chapter?
we see we see a powerful reflection here in having hearts to want to be in the master's presence that's that's key it's a heart issue you know and when it says here in verse 29 the children of israel brought a voluntary offering to yahweh all the men and women whose hearts moved them to bring all kinds of work which yahweh by the hand of moshe had commanded to be done in other words you don't bring what you think Yahweh wants. You've had ears to hear to know what Yahweh wants, and you bring it voluntarily. It's an expression of a declaration of saying, I, my heart is in it. And how you see, we can't see each other's hearts, but we see through our, we, man sees the eyes. In other words, man sees what one does, what one says, what one, you know, and, and so we will see, voluntary hearts that are moved in our actions. We'll see that in others too. And so when each one is playing its part, it becomes so joyous to see. It becomes something that's infectious in a good way. You know, not all infections are bad, if you want to put it that way. You know, being infected or infused with the zeal for Yahweh is something that is fueled greatly when everyone begins to just respond to Yahweh's instructions, you know. And guarding the good treasure and the deposit of the truth in our hearts will keep us from sinning and being lawless. That's where Tehillah 119, I believe Ezra wrote that in, in the return of the exile. We were speaking about the rebuilding of the walls and the timing of the psalm actually points clearly toward Ezra the scribe as, as one who wrote this wonderful psalm about a love for the Torah that had been neglected but now had been found again. In verse 11, he says, I've treasured up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So he's, he's admitting that without the word, I'm going to sin. So I've treasured up your word in my heart. I haven't locked it away and, you know, it's in a treasure chest and I don't know what's inside and I'll see it one day. No, it's, it's, sta it's stationed in one's heart to be that which comes out of one's life, you know. Carol's saying it's a heart thing. Praise Yah, verse 21 and verse 29. It really is a heart thing. That's what it comes down to. And the heart of the matter is we need to ask ourselves every now and then, especially when it feels like, okay, or you go through different cycles in life. You know, we spoke a, a week or so ago about Shaul learning to be content, whether it was going good, whether it was rough. But sometimes we have to just say to ourselves, is my heart still in it? Now, we hope it is because we should be encouraging one another. We should be fanning into flame the good deposit that was put in us, you know. Colossians 3, verse 16 to 17 says, Let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing with pleasure in your hearts to the Master, in psalms and songs of praise and spiritual songs. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Master, Yahushua, giving thanks to Elohim the Father through him. So the people brought earrings, nose rings, necklaces, whatever jewelry they had. They brought everything they had that had not been made into a golden calf because <laughs> now was the clear lesson. They thought, oh, well, at first they thought, make us a mighty one. And we, look, we discussed, it, uh, you know, the sin that was done where Yahweh wanted to destroy the nation after hearing clearly twice from the very mouth of Yahweh not to make an image. So that which they had thought, hey, we got all this, let's do that, because they were brought up in a corrupt worship system. They thought they could reenact that unto Yahweh, and he said no. So what they now did, this was, this was a, in a sense, Yahweh gave them another go at bringing it the right way and doing it according to his pattern through that which Moshe instructs. Because remember, they told Moshe, we can't hear him anymore. You go and get whatever he says and we'll do it. And Yahweh told Moshe, he's told them, now will you? Because right in the beginning, before Yahweh spoke, he said, if you obey me, you'll be my treasured possession. And now this treasured possession wants to obey from the heart and they bring of the treasures of their life. That it wasn't for self, it was for Yahweh. And what Yahweh puts into our lives must always, first and foremost, be for Yahweh. Because we are a people that have died to self and are living in the resurrection power of our master, or we should be, you know. Much of what have can, could be used, think about this, much of what have, could have been used for the tabernacle 
was actually given over to a golden calf. So there was a lot of wastage. Now there was plenty of, uh, <laughs> there was an abundance, and we'll see in the next chapter there, they were told, please stop bringing, you know. That doesn't mean, okay, we can give some to that and waste it because we have enough. No. We have to make sure that whatever we're doing, it's unto the master. We cannot bring to Yahweh that which has been dedicated to a false form of worship or service. And so many people are giving so much in order to build falsified programs or systems of religion and programs that have major building projects too because it makes them feel good in the flesh. But it's not for the building up of Yahweh and his kingdom or Yahweh's kingdom in people, you know. That which Israel brought in terms of being a wave offering is exactly that. They lifted it up and they said, this is for Yahweh. And when one brought, brought a, a wave offering, the Tanufa, which is pictured as a cyclical rehearsal at Shavuot, when the, the first fruits is brought at Shavuot, not at Matzot, it's the sheaf that's waved, but Shavuot, the first fruits is brought, it's given wholeheartedly. It's lifted up in one's hand as a reflection of the thanks of what Yahweh's put in your hands to do, to give to him. And the wave offering represents, I'm surrendering this to Yahweh. Our hands speak of our works. And when Shaul says he desires that men everywhere lift up hands that are set apart, what he's saying is everything that we do ought to be done to Yahweh. There should be nothing done in our lives with a selfish motive. Because then we've missed the mark. And it's as good as giving it to a golden calf and saying this is for Yahweh, when actually it's an abomination in his eyes, you know. Giving your best with all your heart shows a, that you are part of a people that are set apart, taking responsibility for the building of Yahweh's dwelling place, which we are together. That's why we are to be building each other up in the most set apart belief. Anybody want to share their thoughts before we look at chapter 36? Um, we've often spoken to people in new jobs, and in some most of the times their complaints will be, "I don't know what my job is." For. And then you have to try and figure out, and it, it's exactly that. If you know exactly what to do, then you can do it with a joyous heart because you know exactly yes. what to do. Yeah. Where the previous chapter in the book of Golden Calf it says, and Moshe saw that Aaron had let the people loose. Yeah. Now they led to their own. Um, devices, interpretations. Okay, how do we do it? Okay, let's do it this way. And everyone's doing what's right in yeah. his own eyes. But that's why it's so beautiful when he gives us precise instructions. You can do it that because you know you're meeting the requirements. Yes. And you can then sit back and say, okay, I brought what was written. And yeah. I did what was asked. You didn't have to, oh, was it enough? Was it not enough? Yeah. And, and again, Yahweh is putting the clear choice before us, these, this was done voluntarily. It needs to come as a response to Yahweh's deliverance. And, and so we see here all those wise-hearted, all those you can see as we go through the wilderness journey, there certainly were those that actually showed a stubborn heart as opposed to a responsive heart. And if we come back to we're all here, we're speaking to the choir, so to speak. But it's a, it's a thing that we need to go out and teach others in the six days of the week. <laughs> you know, why a Sabbath is so important. Why is it important to you? Do you know that? Maybe this Torah portion awakens that reality, that understanding. Why Sabbath is so important. Why? Because then when you understand that and you've, I mean, it's commanded, but you voluntarily respond. You can go out and share with people why Sabbath is important to you. Mm. We do not want to be scared or afraid because in verse 35 he says, he has told them what he has given. Yes. Yes. So we don't need to be afraid. when we, we, and, and it comes, if people, this is the thing that we need to be telling people out there who think they're doing great deeds, you know, mm. many mighty works we have done in your name, many will come and say. But if they're not following the pattern, They'll be regarded as unknown and workers of lawlessness. What you did with your deeds was not according to the pattern, you know. And as Yan was saying from this chapter in 35, that everyone was given the wisdom. Yahweh gives you the ability. When you submit to him to listen 
and get taught by him through Moshe and the prophets directing you back to him. In other words, you get taught by Moshe. The prophets is always a warning of leaving Moshe and what will happen. So encouraging you to stay in Moshe and the renewed writings is the revelation of why we stay in Moshe, if that makes sense. Mm. So we need them collectively. But now when we go out and when we're doing that, Yahweh gives you the wisdom. That's why we've got to go get the wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. So that he gives you the wisdom, but you've got to be getting it. You know, And that getting of the wisdom is a hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's by doing everything with the work of your hands in righteousness. You don't put your hands to falsehood. You don't join in wicked works. You don't become connected mm. in wicked ways because all it's going to do is pull you away from righteousness and cause you to put on some hypocritical show that will just be shown up as lawless works done in in vain, you know. And so we see from this chapter a clear responsibility that's given out, and those that respond can respond so with great joy. Carol's saying that Yahweh gives us wisdom to do the things he's asked us to do. Yaakov 1, verse 5 to 8. It also says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask, and Yahweh will give it lavishly. He will, you know what? Uh, people are, if you don't know what to do, then go and seek Yahweh. Seek him in his word. And let that time that you spend in his word allow his wisdom to be implanted in you to bring about clarity and understanding so that when you do every single word or deed in the name of Yahushua Messiah, clarity will unfold, so to speak, because understanding comes in the doing. You don't always understand why, you know, the father says do this, and most children don't understand when they're told, you do not do this, you do that. The flesh naturally, because we've all been born in sin, rejects it. I don't want to. You know? But when we begin to submit to our master's commands, suddenly it becomes easier. At first, it's not so easy. And he disciplines us. He corrects us. He trains us. And it's sometimes a bit aina for good reason. But when we get trained in righteousness, we are then equipped to train others. And that's why we ought not to be people that's spoken of in the book of Hebrews where they continue needing milk when they should be eating the meat and teaching people the word, but they still need the same foundations laid over and over again, you know? So we have to understand that if we're not growing, then we actually are not hearing and not doing. Or we might just be hearers but not doers of the word. Proper doers of the word will grow. It's a guarantee. When you're thinking about why you're doing what you're doing, yes. not just, I mean, when you're baby, you must just blindly follow. Yes. The problem comes where you must understand why you're doing what you're doing. Mm. So we must consider what we do and why we do it every day of our life. What mm. fits into the mm. purpose. Yeah. And we know that we have an enemy that's seeking to devour, that's trying to destroy the plans, destroy the building process, bringing breaches within the wall. That's why one of the lessons that... Um, in terms of Nehemiah and the rubble, mm. is that in, in Jan and I, we, we were talking this week, Jan and Melinda and Kalina and I, and we were just saying how if one, think about it like this, if, if, if one part of the wall is not being built correctly, it affects the other parts of the wall. And if you, in other words, if you're not doing your part mm. in the six days of the week, but you come together in the assembly, you've brought a breach and it can affect everyone in the assembly. One of the lessons that we learned through the, uh, journeys of Israel when they went into the promised land is that of Achan who took of the spoils of Yerihu which were commanded not to be taken mm. and as a result when they sent men like eyes not a lot of people will send a small army they were beaten down and 36 men died as a result of not seeking Yahweh first and that's a mm. primary lesson that Yahshua learned and secondly how through one man's sin disobeying Yahweh brought a breach and caused 36 to die so we also realize our responsibility in taking responsibility, in bringing our lives voluntarily as a daily living sacrifice before our master, because that's our reasonable, well-pleasing worship that Romans speaks of. We'd like to read chapter 36.
And Betzalel and Aholia and every wise-hearted man in whom Yahweh has given wisdom and understanding to know how to do all work for the service of the set-apart place shall do according to that all that Moshe has commanded. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and Moshe called Betzalel and Aholia and every wise-hearted man in whose heart Yahweh had given wisdom, everyone whose heart lifted him up to come and do the work. And they received from Moshe all the contribution which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the set-apart place. But they still brought to him voluntary, voluntary offerings every morning. So all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the set-apart place came, each from the work he was doing, and they spoke to Moshe, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which Yahweh commanded us to do. Then Moshe commanded, and they sent this word throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the contribution of the set-apart place. And the people were withheld from bringing, so that they had, so what they had was enough for all the work to be done, more than enough. Then all the wise-hearted ones among whom, among them who worked on the dwelling place made ten curtains woven of fine linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. They made them with cherubim, the work of a skilled workman. The length of each curtain was twenty-eight cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits, all the curtains having one measure. <coughs> and he joined five curtains, one to another, and the other five curtains he joined one to another, and he made loops of blue <coughs> on the edge of the curtain of one set, and the same he did to the edge of the end curtain of the other set. Fifty loops he made on one curtain, and fifty loops he made on the edge of the end curtain of the second set. The loops held each one curtain together. <coughs> and he made fifty hooks of gold, and joined the curtains to each other with the hooks, and the dwelling place became one. And he made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the dwelling place. He made eleven curtains. The length of each curtain was thirty cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits, the eleven curtains having one measure. And he joined five curtains by themselves, and six curtains by themselves. And he made loops on the edge of each curtain in one set, and fifty loops he made on the edge of the curtain of the set on the curtain of the second set. And he made fifty bronze hooks to join the tent to be one. And he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering of fine leather above that. And for the dwelling place he made boards of acacia wood standing up. The length of each board was ten cubits and the width of each board a cubit and a half. Each board had ten, two tenons for binding one to another. So he did to all the boards of the dwelling place. And he made boards for the dwelling place, twenty boards for the south side, and he made forty sockets of silver to go under the twenty boards, and two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the other side of the dwelling place, on the north side he made twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under the one board, and two sockets under the other board. And he made six boards for the west side of the dwelling place. And he made two boards for the two back corners of the dwelling place. And they were double beneath, and similarly they were complete to the top by one ring. So he did to both of them for the two corners. And there were eight boards, and their silver sockets, sixteen sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. And he made bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards of the dwelling place at the rear westward. And he made the middle, middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. And he overlaid the boards with gold, and their rings were made of gold to be holders for the bars, and overlaid the bars with gold. And he made a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine worked linen. And he made with cherubim, it was made with cherubim, the work of a skilled workman. And he made four columns of acacia wood for it and overlaid them with gold, with their hooks of gold. And he cast four sockets of silver for them. And he made a covering for the tent door of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen 
made by a weaver and is five columns with their hooks and the overload overlaid their tops and their rings with gold but their five sockets were of bronze. Okay, so Betzalel, we, we looked at Betzalel and Ahuliav last week, and I'll just remind you, Betzalel Bet, means in the shadow of or the protection of El. And he was the son of Uri, which means fiery or my light, son of Khur, which means white or absolutely white, and he was from the tribe of Yehuda, which means praised. So the first one that was called by name in this instructions to build the tabernacle. We metaphorically are able to see the one who is in the shadow of El, who is my light and is absolutely white, is to be praised. Because that's who we are praising. We are praising Yeshua says, I am the light of the world, you know, and he is the master builder. He's the one that we listen to and praise. Uhuliav means father's tent. And he was the son of Achisamach, which means my brother has supported. And he was from the tribe of Dun, which means judge. And what strikes me here is that we see this term for who, the, the term or phrase for whom Yahweh has given. We see that there's no institution that can give what Yahweh can. Mm. So this is what Yahweh had given. Mishle 24 verse 3 to 5, 4 verse says, By wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So it's only by wisdom is a house built, but not wisdom that is of this world. That's where Shaul writes to the Corinthians. Where's the debater of this age? Where's the scholar of this age? Wisdom of this world is foolishness with Elohim. But the wisdom that's from above, that is what equips us and builds us and strengthens us and causes us to be proper ambassadors of our master. And the Torah is spiritual because it came from above. Just because Moshe gave the instructions here on earth, the instructions came from above. Hmm. Now, wisdom, we know in Hebrew is the word chokhmah, which means wisdom or skill, coming from the verb chacham, which means to be wise or make wise or to be skilled. And so wisdom at, as, at its core actually represents one's ability to separate the good from the bad, the right from the wrong, the clean from the unclean, the set apart from the profane the left from the right most people today don't even know they're left from their right you know and this we are able to do is we exercise true discipline in guarding the word and understanding coming from the root word binya means consideration or discernment or an understand an understanding that one has coming from the verb bin which means to act wisely to diligently consider think about this how many of you found yourselves acting foolishly because you just reacted too quickly, mm. as opposed to carefully considering what your next action should be. You know? Again, in Tehillah 119, we see the cry of the psalmist saying, make me understand that I might observe your Torah and guard it with all my heart. So he's also crying out to Yahweh, make me understand. In other words, he's submitting to saying, I'll do what you tell me to do. Just help me understand. Make me understand. I'm ready to be obedient to you. And in verse 104, he says, from your orders, I get understanding. Therefore, I have hated every false way. So a lot of people can sit and say, make me understand, make me understand, and just sit and wait. But they, they don't realize it's from Yahweh's orders that they get understanding. So Yahweh says, okay, well, that's what my word says, so do it, and you'll get understanding. It's, a, it's actually a simple uh, um, formula, you know. Mishle 2 verse 4 to 5 says, If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you would understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of Elohim. In Mishle 9 verse 10, it says, The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the set-apart one is understanding. So if you don't have a reverence for Yahweh, your wisdom journey will not begin. Because when you have a fear of Yahweh, you will, support, you will submit to his commands, you will do what he says, 
And then knowledge of the set apart one grows, the understanding. You know, one of the prayers that Patrick likes to uh, um, also pray from Ephesians is that we grow, yes, you're looking at me, Patrick, that we grow in the knowledge of our master, you know, and grow in our knowledge and be able to understand who he is. We can only do that when we are properly being built up. And the Hebrew word uh, uh, binya, understanding, coming from the, the uh, word bin, which is to act wisely or consider, we also understand that one of the words that are related to this is bana, which is to build up. Now, as living stones, we are being built up in the wisdom of the master, and therefore, as each part is seeking Yahweh and bringing their part, understand. can you think about it? They were all bringing everything needed for the tabernacle. And as it was being made, it began to make sense. Mm. The understanding of why we had to, what will my little part help? Look how it's weaved into that covering of the courtyard or whatever, or the gate. Look how that which you brought was made into, look what you brought, it was used as a tent peg. And some people often think, well, my little part can't really do anything. And we're told in the book of Ezra, you know, if Yahweh had not left us a peg in the set apart place, we would be like Sedim and Amora, we'd be destroyed. So, you know, we think about this, that a little thing like the tent peg, so critical to the design. And in this chapter, we read about the sockets and the tenon joints. If the, if the boards weren't made correctly, they wouldn't be joined together correctly. They wouldn't stand upright in their sockets correctly. Standing on sockets of silver representing the redemption upon which we stand. You know, and with two tenons in each one joining together, it's one of the strongest joints that you can get in woodworking. And so therefore we understand that we're not lone rangers. We have to be locked in. It's a picture again of when Messiah sent his taught ones out two by two, you know, because we, we realize that we're in this together. We're locked in. And we see the picture of 40 sockets of silver or 50 loops on the, on the curtain looped together. We see the 11 curtains being brought together. It's a picture again of 10 represents a basket, an effer basket, 10 omers. And with our master being our head, the 11th, you know, and we understand this unity that's brought together in our master. 40 being a picture of uh, refinement through testing. 50 being a picture of release. So we're not released from obedience. We're released from sin and lawlessness that binds us in agreement to our master being made one. Because when the curtains are brought together, they're made one. You know, so we, we see all these wonderful pictures. But what's even so powerful that I said now we, before we read this chapter in verse 5, when the people came to Moshe, they said, listen, the people are bringing too much. You can imagine they kind of like, whoa, I'm still busy here. I haven't got space to work because you're bringing too much stuff here. Mm. You know? Moshe commanded and said, don't let any man or woman do any more for their contribution of the set-apart place. And they were withheld from bringing. Now think about this. The dwelling place will be built when people are offering too much. In other words, you can't outgive Yahweh. Now there's wisdom in this because they needed space, you know, and we see that there's enough to do what's required, which also shows us that Yahweh does not waste. Mm. You know, and it's, there's a, there's a difference in when you're responding voluntarily because your heart is moved to be part of Yahweh's building process, then there's never a concept of too much. But when people are stubborn-hearted and always finding, trying to find a way out of their responsibility, they will always find other purposes for the things that should be used for the esteem of Yahweh. And by the time that they've fulfilled all their other needs... What comes back? Oh, well, mm, uh, sorry, couldn't make it now. Had my other things to do. Sorry, can't bring it towards Yahweh's building. And this is the, this is the positive picture that we see here in this. You know, at the times of Nehemiah, what they were doing when they were rebuilding the walls and Nehemiah went away and they brought in foreigners to stay in the, in the set-apart place, Tovia, who was not full-blooded Israelite, you know, he was an enemy, he ended up staying in the chambers where the, they put out all the wood for the, 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 the fire of the slaughter place and took all that out and the, all the uh, stuff that was to be used in service of the tabernacle, they emptied out those rooms and let people come and stay in them. And when Nehemiah came back, he said, what's going on here? And he chased them all out. 
Because mm. obviously then if you know, there's no place to put it, we're not going to bring. And what happened is people stopped supplying what was needed for the, the service. So the Levites then went had to find their own work in the fields. Because And when Nehemiah came back, he said, what are you doing? Why are you not doing service? Well, there's nothing, not, we, we can't survive. We need to go out and make our way. Mm. And so we see that that's a negative aspect that he rebuked them for and restored. What we see is when you follow Yahweh's pattern, whatever's in your life is Yahweh's. That's why we cannot outgive him. We cannot overgive him, if you will. Whatever we have is something that is, he's been put into our lives with a responsibility. And that responsibility is shown. There was an abundance here. So what would the people have done with that which was not required anymore? It surely it was theirs too, you know. And he, he writes in the prophets, prophets of Yechezkel, Yahweh says, I adorned you. This building of the tabernacle with the gold, the silver, the bronze, the purple and the scarlet and the, the, the fine linen, you know, the, the ram skins dyed red, the, the embroidery that was done, the skill that was used. It made this dwelling place in a journey in the wilderness look spectacular. Mm. So our master clothes us from on high and he adorns us with the beauty of his word. But what did Israel do when they went into the promised land? They threw off that adornment and gave it to idols. They gave their beauty that Yahweh had given them to idol worship. And so we understand again that that which Yahweh equips us with is not to be used for that which does not esteem Yahweh. You know, and that's why we keep coming back to Shaul's lesson in Colossians, whatever you do in word or deed, do in the name of Yeshua Messiah. You know, and so we see wonderful pictures here that making a covering of the, the, the tent with ram skins dyed red is a picture of Messiah coming. The ram is always forever in the Hebraic mindset, a picture of a substitutionary sacrifice. Because mm. remember when Abraham went to offer up Yitzchak and Yitzchak, a grown man in his 30s, asked his dad, where is the lamb when he was carrying the wood? And Avram said, on this hill, Yahweh will provide. Yahweh yire. You know? And when he was about to slaughter his son, the messenger stopped him. He says, now I know you believe. And, it, and in the book of Hebrews, we read about how he received his son in type back from the dead. And in the thorn bush was a ram. And he slayed the ram. And he offered that to Yahweh and built a slaughter place and called this place Yahweh yire, which would become the foundation of the place of Yahweh's house in time to come for a people that Yahweh had promised to give Abraham as a nation that would be set apart. Joshua is saying we are nothing without the Torah. The Torah of Yahweh is perfect, bringing back the being. The witness of Yahweh is trustworthy, making wise the simple. That's from Tehillah 19 verse 7. And so we understand that without Yahweh's Torah, we cannot actually give back to him anything. If we're not subjecting ourselves to proper obedience to his word, and guarding that word in every facet of our lives, what we think we can bring to him is not actually acceptable before his mm -hmm. face. You know? Anybody want to share their thoughts on this chapter? Any question on the boards, the dwelling place, anything? I mean, the reason I'm kind of not skipping over it, but we've, we've dealt in depth about each element of the dwelling place mm. that has been brought about. And I'm not saying I don't want to discuss that again, but I, what we're highlighting through this is the main lesson that we can take from this is that they did what was instructed. Mm. And we have the written witness of that which was instructed from Yahweh to Moshe to the people was done exactly according to the pattern, you know, this concept of giving too much is something that I think people fear hearing because they think that you're just trying to preach a prosperity thing for gain mm. because we've come out of a corrupted system that has misappropriated Yahweh's word for gain Joel warns us in the last days they will use you for gain you know it's almost unbelievable and unrealistic when we read this, that they had to be told to stop. In our minds, because of this, the nature of what we've come out from in fleshly ways, the first response in people's ways when they don't think about what the instructions are calling for is this wall comes up. Boom. Now you, They hear the word, you must give, 
and as soon as give the word give comes, it's like, well, master shuts ears because it's it almost feels like how we can't really comprehend how this actually went on, you know, especially in the light of the times that we we are living in now when we see what's going on. You know, we see this happening, we do see this happening in a small remnant way where there's willing hearts that are so committed to giving their whole beings to the master in service of the kingdom. And you've got to ask yourself, where does this kind of attitude come from? Where does this zeal, and if I liken it to the zeal of Pinchas, that's ready to put to death all whoring, not bringing mixing in the camp, not allowing mixing to take place, it comes from a repentant heart. A repentant heart truly says, take all I am. That's why Shaul says, I die daily. You know? Think about this. As we go through the progression of events here, the Israelites had just witnessed 3,000 of their own being put to death by Yahweh, sending a plague and fire in the camp. And this was a sobering wake-up call. And so part of the zeal to bring all they had was certainly due to recent events. Because you, and, and when we read of the revelation of what is to unfold when our master comes again, it should be an encouragement to us who are in him because we see the power of his protection over us. We need not fear that which can kill the body. But to those that are kind of on the outskirts and in but not really in, it should be a wake up to say, oh, I don't want to be part of that, you know. A lot of them that were trying to make up now f- for the fleshly worship that they had engaged in realized they're wrong and now wanted to do it right. Okay. And they did it from, a fle- from bringing that which they brought in the flesh, so to speak. They did a wrong thing in the flesh by making a, giving what they had in their hands to a golden calf. Now they repented of that and want to be proper spiritual house. That doesn't mean a lot of people want to spiritualize things where it still requires what's in your hand practically, but it's are you doing it in a fleshly way for self or are you doing it in a spiritual way which is in submission and obedience to Yahweh? You know, you know, and so they hopefully would not be found trapped again by following after the things of the flesh, but saying, okay, let me first hear what Moshe says. When one recognizes the need to build that which is required by Yahweh, then one's interest takes a backseat. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you don't have your interests, but Philippians 2 verse 21 says, for all seek their own interests not those of Yeshua Messiah. Now, when he says, put others first, it doesn't mean that you must now play the martyr and you have nothing. But it means if you're just living for self in your own little bubble, it's going to get burst. Mm. The picture of the assembly in Macedonia who gave out of their poverty is a classic example of selfless giving. When Shaul writes to the believers in Corinth in his second letter in chapter 8, verse 1 to 4, He says, now, brothers, we make known to you the favor of Elohim, which has been given in the assemblies of Macedonia, that in much trial of pressure, the overflowing of their joy and their deep poverty overflowed into the riches of their generosity. Because I bear witness that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily, uh, begging us with much urgency for the favor of taking part of the service to the set apart ones. What he was highlighting to a very disconnected assembly in Corinth, he says, learn from these guys. They weren't looking at their circumstances. In fact, despite their circumstances, they wanted to be part in whatever way they could be. Mm. Yeshua comes along and he sees a, a, a widow giving her two mites. And he says she's given more than all these guys because she gave everything she had where all these guys are giving out of their excess. It's easy to give out of your excess. You know, what Israel were doing here, they had excess, but they kept giving and they were told stop. So there's a positive behind that. It doesn't mean that we must have nothing in order to show that we're giving. What it says is whatever you have, whether you have excess or not, are you putting Yahweh as the primary focus of why you are living and what you are part of, you know? The design of the tabernacle would also carry a reminder of us of carrying a repentant heart that guards us against the luring lusts of the flesh. 
We're clearly told in the renewed writings that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of Elohim. You know? And when we continually remember his loving commitment, his kindness, his compassion, his mercy toward us, we become sensitive to the needs of all. That's why in Mishle it says to us, you do not withhold from your brother when you have it within you to help him. Now, if you can't help, that's honest. I can't. But when you have the ability, you help one another. But your help doesn't, and this is another lesson, your help doesn't replace Yahweh being put first. Because that's what a lot of people do. They do a lot of deeds to a lot of things when it comes to actually Yahweh being put first. No, no, they don't need it because it's almost like there's enough there. And then they try and enact their own pattern of how they interpret. So when we're going through this pattern, we're just realigning focus, you know. Giving our all unto Yahweh certainly costs you. It will cost you your possessions that we often try to hold so tightly onto. It will also cost you your privacy in many ways, you know, because it's going to take you out of your own way of doing things and it's going to expose you into actually being, saying, I'm part of a whole. So it's going to take you out of your comfort zones. And in Lucas 14, verse 28 to 33, because all of this is about building that we're looking at here. He says, for who of you wishing to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation and is unable to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was unable to finish. Or well, what sovereign going to fight against another sovereign does not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So then every one of you who does not give up all that he has is unable to be my taught one. Now, this isn't a lesson on you're not allowed to have anything. What it means is if you are saying, I understand, but that's as much as I'm doing for Yahweh because I'm, then you've missed this point. What Yeshua is saying is he's bought you at a price. You're his now. And, he, and, you know, if you have excess in you, think, ask him, seek him by wisdom. Why do I have this? What's it for? If you have nothing, you say, what is my purpose? You still seek the same wisdom from above of how you can be part of a whole, you know. Yeshua said in terms of the dwelling place, he said to Kepha in chapter 16 of Matthew, he said, I also say to you that you are Kepha and on this rock I shall build my assembly and the gates of the grave shall not overcome it. Now it was on the confession of who Yeshua is. When he asked them, who do you say, who, what do the people say? And they said, no, some say Yochanan the Immersa, some say Eliyahu, one of the other prophets. He said, what do you say I am? And Kepha, being bold, stood up and said, you are Yeshua Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. Now that's a fulfillment of prophecy. He said, you were not able to say this except by the Spirit given to you. Because it's by revelation that no one is able to say that Yeshua is master except by the set-apart Spirit. And he said, on that confession, I'll build my assembly. Because when you make that confession, you've made the confession that Yahweh himself came in the flesh as fulfillment of prophecy because the title son of Elohim was a fulfillment of what the prophets were pointing to in saying Yahweh's coming to call us back to himself. He sent his prophets, but he himself is coming. Son of the living Elohim, born in the flesh. And when we recognize that, we realize that now we die to self and we live to him alone. And it's on that confession that he says, that's how I build, because now you're putting me first, you know. And then we see the, the different coverings of the tabernacles teaching us that we have all that we need while we're in this corruptible body. We have a covering that gives us the ability to bear the master's presence his way as we journey as, as faithful or Trustworthy ambassadors. Anybody want to share anything? I see Jan's getting ready to read chapter 38 there. 37, sorry. Jumping ahead. 37. Yeah, Craig, I just had some thoughts about this uh, whole notion of giving what we have to each other and the whole uh, civilization that we've enjoyed up till now has been predicated uh, on this community of giving to each other. Mm. And in acts of service, that's where we get yes. to, to love as well. 
uh, and you know, humanity, given the definition of human, is monster. And we take that away, <laughs> yes, and more selfish, uh, selfless, but like, you know, yeah. And I see so much of this virtuous charity kind of stuff that's very much based on, you know, look at me, I'm great, I am giving everything that I have away, and all that sort of stuff. And what you just spoke about here was that it's not for human uh, or us as living uh, entities. Yeah. Uh, nor we have to do this. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, if it's not about us at all. It, it's That's why... I mean, I used the example of the widow because she wasn't there saying, look, 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 who am I? But the, the rich ones were saying, everybody, <clears throat> you know, just watch what I'm putting in now, you know. And we saw that in a false system. And, and that's one aspect of literal putting something in a box or whatever. But, again, you talk about the programs and the, and the charities and everything else that's set up. It's always set up to esteem man. And, and, and they, they actually try and present it as a, you know what, actually a lot of, some of the most corrupt businesses today are set up as non-profits. <laughs> because it ultimately actually comes back to self. And all they're doing is they're evading man's inspection upon them, in a sense. And so what we're seeing through this pattern is a clear picture of, we're not talking literally only that monetary value, but if that's in your hand, then that's of the works of your life. We're talking about being built up as selfless stones that are living in the master because it always becomes about him, you know. Uh, Renee's saying, not easy to grasp if you don't spend time in the word and live according to his set-apart pattern. That's why people can't understand. If you think... Firstly, you can't understand if you don't hear, because hear God and do, because you, your understanding comes in the doing. If people aren't listening, they cannot do. So they do their own works. And that's why they do their works. They boast in their works, but they actually lack the understanding of what the pattern is, because they don't know the pattern. You know? Encourage you to take a look at the notes and all the little pictures of the boards and how they were put together with the tenons and, you know, the back two extra boards that were there on the corners and, you know, it just gives a bit of insight of how they would have built this. And we often think sometimes, we think, geez, wow, all this time in the wilderness. I mean, that's like 3,000 or how many thousand years ago, you know? These guys didn't have all the fancy tools we had today. No, they had Yahweh's wisdom and skill given to them, you know? And so we must never think that we don't have what it takes. That's what I'm highlighting here. When you have Yahweh, you have what it takes. You know. Okay, chapter 37, Jan. And Bitzel made the ark of acacia wood two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. And he overlaid it with clean gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold all around it. And he cast four rings of gold for it, for its four feet, two rings on the one side and two rings on the other side. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to lift the ark. And he made a lid of atonement of clean gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And he made two cherubims of beaten gold. He made them from the two ends of the lid of atonement. One cherub on the one side of the, on the one end of the, on each side, and the other cherub on the other end on that side. He made the cherubim from the lid of atonement from the two ends, and the cherubim spread out their wings above, and covered the lid of atonement with their wings, with their faces towards each other. The faces of the cherubim were turned up toward the lid of atonement. And he made the table of acacia wood two cubits long, and a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. And he overlaid the clean gold, overlaid it with clean gold, and made a molding of gold all around it. And he made a rim of a hand breath all around it, and made a molding of gold for the rim all around it. And he cast four rings of gold for it and put the rings on the four corners that were at its four legs. And the rings were next to the rim as holders for the poles to lift the table. And he made the poles of acacia wood to lift the table and overlaid them with gold. And he made the utensils which were on the table, its dishes and its cups 
and its bowls and its jars for pouring of clean gold. And he made the lampstand of clean gold. And he made the lampstand of beaten work, its base and its shelf, its cups, its ornament, ornamental knobs, and its blossoms were from it. And six branches came out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of the one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. There were three cups like almond flowers on, on one branch, with ornamental knob and blossom, and three cups like almond flowers on the other branch, knob and a blossom, so for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand were four cups like almond flowers, its knobs and its blossoms, and a knob under the first two branches of the same, and a knob under the second branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, for the six branches coming out of it. The knobs and the branches were of it, and all of it was one beaten work of clean gold, and he made it seven lamps, and its snuffers, and its trays of clean gold. He made it of a talent of clean gold, and all its utensils, and he made the incense slaughter place of acacia wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide, square, and two cubits high, its horns were of it, and he overlaid it with clean gold, its tops, and its sides all around, and its horns, and he made a moulding for it of gold all around it, and he made two rings of gold for it, under its moulding, at its two corners on both sides, as holders for the poles to which to lift it, and he made the poles of acacia wood, and overlaid them with gold, and he made the set apart anointing oil, and the clean incense of sweet spices, according to the work of the perfumer. Okay, so here now we see how Yahweh works in our lives from the inside out. And it begins with our heart because it's a heart issue. It's a circumcision of the heart that takes place at our immersion where he puts his word and he begins to now allow that word to work out in us. And so we see here again with that which was made in this chapter, we see the skill that Betzalel was given. He makes the Ark of Acacia wood. He overlays it with gold. It was the, the Ark of the Covenant that was put in there, the two tablets of the stone that were the witness of Yahweh's words. Two copies, you know. It wasn't five commands on one stone and five commands in the other. They were written on front and back. So like any contract where party, each party has their copy, so too were there two tablets of stone, one to represent Yahweh's copy, one to represent ours, and that was given as a witness together, kept in the Ark of the Covenant, which nobody was ever to look inside. Again, it's like we can't see the inside, but we know what should be inside. And the Ark was overlaid with gold inside and out, showing that that which is reflected outside should be a representation of what's going on inside. Yeshua rebukes a religious Pharisee saying they're whitewashed tombs, you know, or they, all they've got inside is dead men's bones. It's death inside them, not life. The Torah is life. So he was basically saying the Torah is not in you because the Torah is not a worthless word to us. It's, in, it's our life. It should be in our hearts and our mouths to do it. When he said to them, you are like your inside are like dead men's bones, he was saying the Torah is not inside you. You've got a coating of oral Torah adding on man's commands, trying to look the part, but you actually are representing death, where the Torah represents life, you know? The copies are in the heart of the tabernacle. Yes. It's like the in our heart, yes. where only Yahweh sees it. Where only Yahweh sees it, but how others should be able to see it is in that working, because what was the focus of the tabernacle? What was the primary focus? Yahweh's presence. So at the heart of that presence is his Torah. And that's where people miss it today. They think they want Yahweh's presence, but they take the heart of it out. And the heart beat, so to speak. The Torah is the heart beat, if you will, that keeps us alive, you know, because Yahweh is Elohim of the living, not of the dead. And there was also Aharon's rod that budded that was put in there. And we also know that the, the, it, it bore ripe almonds, and almonds is a representation or the almond tree, a representation of the life that our master gives us, the abundance, the, the beginning and the end, because it's known as the aleph and the tav tree in one sense, because it bears leaves, but it's the last to grow its fruit or its nuts, <laughs> you know. And the pot of golden or the golden pot with manna, 
that was some of the mana that would not breed worms and stink because it was kept over a day. This is Yahweh's provision as a witness inside there. And whenever we look at the Ark of the Witness, we're reminded of the promise. Remember, nobody would look inside that. But it would always be in the hearts and minds of people what was put inside as a reminder to say, what you can't see should be still inside you. And one of the assemblies in Chazon was told if they overcome, they would be given of the hidden manna. In other words, they would gain access into Yahweh's presence, be part of the bride, you know. And that manna, which represents, you know, the Hebrew word, it's actually the Greek word that's manna. I know we say manna, but the Hebrew word is man. And so when they saw the man in the wilderness, they didn't see the man, they saw the man in the wilderness, they said, man. You know, in Afrikaans, it's man, eh, yan. <laughs> you know, it's like, what is this? Or in Greek, mana. You know, many of us South Africans, when you don't like or you don't understand, you say, man. That's what they did in the wilderness. They didn't know what this mana was, this substance on the ground. And Yehoshua said, he is that which came out from the heavens. And many came, he said, who are you? Pilate even said, what is truth? And truth was standing right in front of him, you know. So those who are able to identify who the master is have a reflection that he, his word is inside them. Because only those who know the master can, that's why he said to Kepha, on your confession, I'll build my assembly. Mm. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, a gate or the gates of a city were the strong point of a city, the strength of a city. Because typically people wouldn't try to get through the walls because or over the walls if the walls were too high or too broad, you know. So the way you get through a city is if you take its gates, you take the city. The judges would sit at the city gates. That's where right ruling would be administered. So when you protect the gates, you protect the city. And so what he's saying is the entrance into the junk of life would not overcome the confession of the master. Hades would not have power over you. Blessed are those who have part of the first resurrection because the second death will have no power over them. These are those bearing the witness of Yeshua Messiah and guarding the Torah. Okay, so we see that the Ark of the Covenant is not something we just read over and think, oh, that's quite clear. We have to understand what it represents and what it represented literally for the people in the wilderness traveling and in the temple. It represented having Yahweh's presence. When they disobeyed him, his presence left and he allowed his Ark to be taken into captivity by the Philistines. And for three months, he plagued them with tumors and cancer. They then sent it back and it stayed in the house of Avinadav for many years. It was for over 40 years under the reign of Shilomo that the Ark of Yahweh was never in Israel's presence, in where the sovereign was. It was in the house of Avinadav in Beit Shemesh. So it did come into their territory, but where it was supposed to be, it was not. And it was only after 40 odd years that David said, Let's go get the ark again. And what happened when he first got the ark? They put it on a wagon. They made a new wagon for it. And it hit a bump in the road. It fell over. It, 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 uh, the ark didn't fall over, but it hit. And Uzzah stretched his hand out to protect the ark, and he died. You're looking a bit. Is it Shalom. During Shemuel, it was taken into captivity. Mm. It's when they asked for a sovereign already. Shalom, Shalom was already reigning. Shaul, sorry, King Shaul was not Shalom. Let me come back. You're right. Let me retract and re retract what I said. Under the reign of King Shaul. Okay, now we're all together on the same page. Okay, so forget Shalom for now. Shalom built a good temple. We're going to read about that in 1 King 7 today. So Shaul didn't want Yahweh's presence. It's a picture of the wicked king that Yahweh did not choose, but the people chose. You see, when you don't follow Yahweh's pattern, you'll set up what you want. Okay? So during King Shaul's reign, <laughs> everybody with me now? Yes. Yeah. Good. Over 40 years, it sat in a place where it wasn't supposed to be. Okay? 
And then when David was set up as sovereign, he said, let's get Yahweh's presence back here, because that's the heart of the design of listening to Moshe, is getting Yahweh's presence in your midst. And when they stumbled and Uzzah died, he put it in the house of Obed Edom. Sorry, I think it was with the Philistines for about seven months, six or seven months, not three. It was in the house of Obed Edom for three months. And David went and he read what the Torah had said mm -hmm. and how they were supposed to carry the ark using the poles that were to be put into the two poles into the four rings by which the priests would bear it upon their shoulders. Mm -hmm. And he told the priests, do according to the Torah of Moshe. Get back to the pattern. And they brought back the Ark of the Covenant, and after every six steps, they slaughtered they had a slaughtering. It's a picture again of six days you work, the seventh, it's coming together in celebration of what Yahweh's done for us. And this is what we do in our rehearsal, bringing back his presence into our lives. David had taken off his royal robes. He wasn't dancing naked, as some like to say. He made himself as one of the people. And this is what was something that was despised by his wife the daughter of Shaul. Mm. And he said, I'll even be called, become more slight than this. And it's a picture, a shadow picture of Messiah coming and laying down his deity and coming to be amongst his people in bringing back his presence into the lives of his beloved bride and doing so with celebration and joy. And when David gave each person a cake of raisins, again, it's not a raisin cake, it's a squashed you know, compressed raisins and bread so they could go make their own bread and use raisins in it if they want. <laughs> but when we see, the, you know, and so again it's a provision of that manna in type that's now returned, the bread of life and the sustenance and the sweetness that's there, this, the ability to be sustained in one's praise. So when we look at this design of the tabernacle and that which is there, we realize how getting Yahweh's presence back into our life is coming back to the pattern of Moshe. You know, we were once foolish in our dancing and misrepresented or misappropriated the clear pattern of the word. And in a sense where we thought Uzzah means strength, thought we were being strengthened, but we were being strengthened in the wrong way. And that being strengthened in the flesh of man will kill you. And when Yahweh's presence went into the house of Obed Edom for three months and his whole household was blessed, mm -hmm. and David saw that it was blessed, he said, well, now I need to get Yahweh's presence back here the way it should be. And he set up a booth for it. He set up a tent for the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, David didn't build a temple. Okay. And at the time of, let me get this right, Shemuel, the Ark of the Covenant was with Shemuel. It was dwelling in a place where Shemuel would administer in Shomiro. Shiloh, sorry. Yes, but when Shemuel was there, okay, it wasn't in uh, Shemuel's house, but it was in Shiloh, okay, which is in the territory of Ephraim, okay. And then obviously we see a clear promise given to David that your son will build the house. You're a man of battle. Where have I ever asked anybody to build me a house? I don't need a house, but your son will build me a house, okay. And so we see this powerful picture of David bringing the ark, the core of what the tabernacle represented. Because without the ark of Yahweh, the tabernacle was fruitless. And any worship or service being done to it was fruitless. And remember, only the high priest would go once a year into the most set-apart place. So for the rest of the year, people didn't see what was in the most set-apart place. They knew what was there, but they didn't get to see it. And it's the same thing for us. We know Yahweh is seated in the heavenly place. We know we will see him at an appointed time on Yom Kippur when he comes out to fetch his bride. But that doesn't mean we don't live like we don't know where he's at. You know? And when David set up a tent for it, he, he commissioned a priesthood to offer praises around the Ark of the Covenant in the booth that he had made for 24 hours a day. And he set up a clear pattern of service of 24 uh, um, divisions of the priesthood to worship around the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. And it's the eighth division where we come to the account of Yochanan the Immerser's father, Zechariah, serving in the order of Aviyah, which was the eighth division of David. 
when he was serving in the temple at that time, where they restored David's service. That service was restored in the days of Ezra. So I'm going a bit on a journey through Scripture for you for good reason to help you understand the presence of Yahweh and what we have today. So David set up a tent for it, and then Shalom built a temple, which we'll read about again today. And then after a time, when this during, um, we see a, a temple being destroyed in 70 AD. We see that there's no more temple. Okay. We also see before Messiah came, they also came and looted the temple and sent Yehuda into captivity. And everything was taken out. In the book of Acts, we see a clear promise of the master restoring the booth of David. And what that represents for us is Yahweh is not concerned about literal bricks and stones. He's concerned about us, his dwelling place, to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings. And that's what the booth or the tent of David represents for us. And that's what he's restoring in our day, is a proper worship unto the master, a proper bringing back the division of worship in its proper pattern. Because now when Yehuda went into Babylonian captivity, there was no more service in the, tab- in the temple. It was broken down. When they came back and started restoring the walls and they had celebration of the walls being restored, they had their first Yom Teruah for many. They saw the former house and they saw the new house and they wept and they praised, etc., etc. Others had never seen the former house. They saw the new house that was being built. They rededicated the slaughter place. They were offering up praise. And Ezra reinstituted the divisions that were given by David. And we can trace that timing of the time that it happened at Yom Teruah when it happened, that we can trace the proper timing of the birth of Yochanan and the birth of Messiah being on the first day of Sukkot, based on the order of divisions that was established. So it's just an interesting fact. If you want to know more about it, I'll explain to you um, one-on-one if you want. But that's all in the notes as well, and in, in not in this week's notes, but other notes that we've gone on. I'm taking on a little bit of a journey of the Ark of the Covenant, which represents Yahweh's presence. When Messiah came in the flesh, laid down his deity, and didn't consider the equality of Elohim something to be grasped, he came in the purpose of restoring a right worship unto him and him alone, in the confession of who he is. In fact, we're warned in 1 John that if the, anyone who does not confess that Yeshua Messiah came in the flesh, do not let that one in your house. How do we apply that today? Well, those who don't say that Yahweh is Yeshua, don't even let them into your house. How do you let people into your house today? Now, firstly, through the door, hopefully, you know, <laughs> not through the window. But more and more today, we let them in through our cell phones, our TVs, our computers. What are we watching? What are we allowing to infiltrate our lives and shape the way we think? And if people are presenting a doctrine of man that does not declare that Yahweh is Yahushua, you shouldn't even be watching those teachings. Don't think, oh, I want to see what they're saying so I can get some meat out of it. No, you are drinking poison and it will kill you. We spoke last week in the word that's in Romans, you know, be innocent toward the evil, you know, and we are to be skilled and urgent for the good. We are to be focused on the good. We shouldn't be allowing things into our lives. And today's technology has made it so easy for the enemy to get into one's lives, even in your inner chamber. And the Ark of the Covenant represents Yahweh's presence in his inner chamber that he allows us access to by the blood of Messiah. And what union has the dwelling place of Yahweh with idols? So in other words, we are the dwelling place of Yahweh. Our focus is his presence, his intimacy. How can we come into his presence, having been washed by the blood of the Lamb, but allowing others into the house that don't confess that he is Yahweh, he is our Savior? I hope you understand why I'm emphasizing what the Ark of the Covenant represents for us, you know, and how it's so important for us to understand restoring Yahweh's presence correctly. 
The ark had always been carried on poles, and it's in uh, 2 Samuel 6 where you'll read about Uzzah and his exploits of not listening to... Now, you've got to think, in a sense, it's almost like a haron. They hadn't received instructions yet, but he made a car. Uzzah, one of the priests, hadn't received instructions yet. Why? And it's a lesson. It's not because they didn't have the Torah. They didn't go look at the Torah. And how many people today are doing things without consulting the word first? Yehoshua mm. learned that lesson a number of times. Number one, with Achan that I spoke of earlier. Number two, the, the, the uh, what do you call them? Uh, the? With Yehoshua. No, not the Reuvenites. That's part of Reuven. That's part of the, 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 not Rechavites. That's another one with those that drank. Wood. Givenites. There we go. The Givenites. Yeah, it was one of those ites. <laughs> Remember when the Givenites pretended to be a nation far off and they made their bread look old and they made their wineskins look old and everything else. And he ate a meal with them and he promised to protect them, to bring them in. And then it was realized, well, hold on, they're just this tribe down the road here that was supposed to be destroyed. <laughs> And Yahweh said, because you made a covenant with them, you will not destroy them. To the point that some of the Givenites later became some of David's mighty warriors. Mm. Okay, But it highlights again a clear witness. When you don't seek Yahweh first, you put yourself in danger of having to be put under control of something else that now there's consequences to those actions of not seeking Yahweh first. That's why Yeshua said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Yahweh made it work out because he promised yes. it to work. Doesn't mean, oh, because they got away with it. We can try it. No. Yeah. No. These are written as examples for us. Mm. In fact, I don't know if you read it, but I did send out a message from Amos this week about the plumb line has been set and how do you measure up? Because, and you tie that in with Chazon 11. It, for me, that was a nice revelation in a sense and growing and understanding again this week is that Amos was given a couple of visions, oracles. He was given eight oracles. Now, three of those oracles we see in, in Amos 7. The first one was one of locusts coming up and destroying Yehuda. And he said, how can they survive if you do this? And Yahweh relented. So he, Amos asked Yahweh to forgive as a picture of intercession. Mm. And Yahweh relented. It's not like Yahweh changed his mind. He was showing something to this prophet. He then shows him fire coming down and destroying Yehuda. And he says, how are they supposed to survive if you do this, please? And Yahweh relented of that. And then he put a plumb line. He said, yeah, Amos, what do you see? I see a plumb line. He said, it's been set. I don't, I don't take this away. They're going to be held accountable according to the standard. And it's a clear picture again, Messiah coming in the flesh, that the plumb line has been set. In Acts, we're told that he once overlooked ignorance, but now he commands men everywhere to repent. There's no excuse not to know the word. The plumb line is a building tool to build upright, to build correctly, so that you don't have problem in construction. When you look at Chazon, um, it's Chazon, sorry, Chazon uh, 11. I think it's 11, where we see a clear woes that are given. After the first trumpet and the second trumpet, and the first one we see the locusts coming out of the deep and having power and authority to torture those that were not sealed for five and a half months. And then we see another picture of the judgment of coming up the horses or horsemen coming up out of the, out of the deep after the next trumpet is blown. And the number of horses with, that had horsemen on them, okay, was 200 million, given authority to destroy a third of mankind. And out of the mouths of these horses came sulfur and fire. So here again, a picture of fire to destroy a third of mankind. And these are the two pictures that you get in Chazon 11. Then you get to the next chapter, and he's given a measuring reed. He sees this one like the son of Adam who has a measuring rod in his hand. Mm. And he's told to go measure the dwelling place, but not the outer court because that's for the nations, and they'll be given up. And we read a bit about this today again. So what we see here is a clear witness of locust, fire, 
plumb line. In Chazon, we see that same pattern in a sense. Sorry, I'm jumping visions here. Today, we're reading about the measuring rod that's given. We'll read that in Chazon 11. But in Chazon 9 and 10, because it was 9 where the two woes were given, in Chazon 10, he sees the son of Adam with like a rainbow around him, etc., or this messenger that's like the son of Adam. And then he's given a little book to read. And that book was sweet in his mouth, but he become bitter in his stomach. And he was told at the end of chapter 10, you now have to go prophesy to many nations. So I, this is a pattern that I'm seeing. Then 11, we're going to read about the measuring rod. Okay. Today, we are looking at fire or locust fire word. So it is in the Chazon. It's a witness to us that Yahweh does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm. And we have this encouragement that those that are sealed in the Master are protected from being destroyed by the woes that he sends on those that are not protected. But it doesn't mean that you do not measure yourself up against the word and the plumb line and be built up according to that standard. So when we're reading about the pattern of Moshe, it's for good reason that we have to follow this pattern lest we find ourselves being destroyed by the locusts or the horsemen and the horses that are coming with authority to torture and authority to destroy. So it's both an encouragement and a warning. The same that Amos gave. When we read Moshe, it's an encouragement and a warning. We read of the accounts that are said of Uzzah. It's an encouragement and a warning. When we bear the master's presence correctly his way, like they did when they restored the pattern, we can go with a rejoicing heart and be fruitful and, and not worry. Michal saying, oh, look at you. You know what? When people speak against you as evil do, as Kepha writes to us, let them by seeing, observing your good works, praise the master in the day of his visitation. So when we're looking at this pattern, it's all about a pattern of worship. And are we measuring up correctly to that pattern or not? The lampstand, as we know, represents a clear witness of us being grafted in as, as branches in the vine. Yochanan 15 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And so we see the design of the lampstand, the menorah, which gives light onto the showbread table, being clearly described as a branch or six branches coming out of the center branch, representing how we are grafted into the master and we shine the light of his truth. And the almond blossoms that would be put on the uh, uh, menorah were 22, representing again the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And the lampstand would give light onto the showbread table. So this is where we think of... It's in the set-apart place that the priest would change the showbread every week. So we understand when we come into the chamber of our master as an assembly, as a kahal, as an ecclesia, we see his light shedding light on our table and bringing understanding and clarity as we eat of his word together and partake of his table in unity of his spirit coming back to the essence of having his presence dwell in our midst because we guard what it means to be in his presence. And no priest could go into that set-apart place if he didn't wash his hands and his feet from the laver that stood outside, you know. Anybody want to share their thoughts on... I know I emphasized a lot on the, the, the Ark of the Covenant this year. I, I really want us to highlight why we do anything that we do is to retain Yahweh's presence in our lives. Something that came up while listening was the, you know, the hearing of instructions and following of instructions kind of a, just a basic requirement. It's like uh, almost ringing of a bell. But if you really want to you know, consider yourself set apart in answering the call, then it actually requires you to do and follow those instructions, execute them, you know, as an example of the previous this morning. Is it? Yes. That really set the people apart. Because everybody around them were hearing the words, everybody around them was quite about following the instructions and stuff like that. But you need to it level up to actually implement what you're reading and yes. what you're studying and stuff like that. Literally, 
That's the way the change happens. Yeah. You know, that's where you can't bring it home. And you can, you know, can't test the present. Because when you start doing things and implementing things that you just read about, study about, <laughs> it's a change of that. Yeah. Um, and I can attest to it. When I start you know, doing things that I just read and, and ponder about and think about and stuff like that, you can actually take it out of your head and your heart and put it in your hands. <laughs> Changes happen. Yeah. And you can actually, if you're aware of it, then you can see it happen in your life as well. Yeah. And that, that really makes the difference. And it's, it's kind of a, it's almost like, I think that the uh, parallel we talked about, you know, the guy who goes out and finds a treasure in the field and he goes and sells everything to go, and, you know, secure that treasure. Yes. And that's basically, you know, you, you've got to go and say, okay, fine, I found a treasure. But now, I guess what I got to do and do something. Well, yes. I go of all the other stuff and go and secure that treasure because, yeah. you know, it's worth so much. Yeah. And Shaul writes to Timotheus that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And that treasure is the knowledge of Elohim. And I know I've said it, every time I think of that verse, I can't help myself but tell you that the Greek word for treasure is thesaurus, from which we get the English word thesaurus, which is a word that helps us be able to get the right word in any situation, <laughs> you know, bringing understanding. And that's what the word of Yahweh does to us. Without his word, we won't have right understanding in any situation. We won't, you can apply different words that will, you know, a word in its fullest form in a different situation that's required. The other thing that we understand is the doing of the word that you're speaking of. That's why when we learn Hebrew, we learn the rules of the language, you know, because unless you learn how a language works, you can't communicate in that language. Mm -hmm. So when we learn that the Hebrew language operates under the clear foundation of it coming from three-letter root verbs, every word, every noun, conjunction, and um, pronoun, uh, adverb, whatever it is, ob uh, uh, what adjective, all come from three-letter root verbs, which is a powerful witness for us because it's a doing language. And if you don't do it, you will never grasp it, you know. And as we said at first, at first doing things doesn't always make sense. It takes a bit of doing mm. to actually let it become natural. Um, Renee's asking what happened to the ark in the word later on. Was it destroyed or lost? Carol's saying Shaul. And then Renee said, mm -hmm. every six steps, how far did they walk? <laughs> okay, so let's, let's try and answer those. Okay, so what happened in, in, in the ark? What happened to the ark in the word later on? Okay, so in the word, what we have is the ark, as I said, went from Eli's. Uh, uh, Ah, well, it went from where Eli was serving as priest. It went from the house there in Shiloh, and it went to the Philistines mm -hmm. for six, seven months. And then it went. Then they sent it back, and it went to Beit Shemesh, yeah. and it ended up in the house of. It was set aside in in the house of Avin, Aminadav. Firstly, the men of Beit Shemesh opened it up to look at it, and they died. Okay. So then it was set aside in the house of Aminadav, and it stayed there for at least forty years under the reign of Shaul. <laughs> okay. When David sought to bring it back, he, he they made a wagon, stumbled along the way, they put it in the house of Oved Edom. Now Oved Edom's house, when you see his whole house got blessed, we understand that Oved Edom represents somebody he owned land and he owned he must he had a if you want to put it in today's term, a big farm. So everyone on his farm and everything, everything on his farm. Could, in three months, everyone could see Yahweh bless that place. What a blessing. David said we've got to get it back. The distance from Oved Edom's house to Yerushalayim, I don't know the miles or the kilometers, but it was a journey. It wasn't just a walk around the block. And it showed, again, it took obedience to carry it on the shoulders and perhaps when we see they walk six steps and stopped, it's a, it's a figurative language. 
They journeyed, and when they stopped, and it's language that teaches us every seventh step is a rest in terms of Shabbat. That's the picture that we get. But it's used again in this joy restoration of Yahweh's presence coming back. But it was, I mean, some might have more accurate distances. We know it wasn't a very short distance. It was a distance that required persistent skill and a continual praise for Yahweh, you know. In terms of that then being set up in the tent of David, it was then put into the temple that Shalomo built. What happened when the, uh, uh, when Yehuda was sent into captivity and the Babylonians destroyed everything, there are various theories about the capitals being shorter and there being mechanical systems to put it away. And, you know, there's lots of theories out there that so many people have seen it hidden under a cave and all these things. Don't get down those rabbit holes. Because in Messiah, we understand that the physical ark has no relevance to us today because it was always a shadow picture of the coming good matters. Messiah is in the heavenly tabernacle, not made with the hands of man. And we are his dwelling place. And the ark or presence of Yahweh should be in each and every one of us. That's the treasure of the hidden manna that we are to retain having his words written upon our hearts. Amen? Okay, who'd like to read chapter 38? It's just 1 to 20. Carol's saying, please tell us more about the lid of atonement and the two keravim. I don't want to make wrong assumptions. Okay, well, I would like to know your assumption before I try and help you understand. So while we're reading... Tell us your assumptions and we'll correct you or encourage you as being correct. How's that? Okay, who'd like to read chapter 38? I'm going to read. Okay. And he made the slaughter place of ascending offering of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide, square and three cubits high. And he made its horns on its four corners, the horns were of it. And he overlaid it with bronze. And he made all the utensils for the slaughter place, the pots and the shovels, and the basins and the forks, the fire holders. He made all its utensils of bronze, and he made a grating for the slaughter place, a bronze network under its rim, midway from the bottom. And he cast four rings for the four corners of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. And he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the slaughter place with which to lift it. He made the slaughter place hollow with boards. And he made the base... And he made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving woman who did service at the door of the tent of appointment. And he made the courtyard. For the south side, the screens of the courtyard were of fine woven linen, 100 cubits long, their 20 columns and their 20 sockets of bronze. The hooks of the columns and their bands were of silver. And for the north side, the screens were 100 cubits long, their 20 columns and their 20 sockets of bronze. The hooks of the columns and their bands were of silver, and for the west side there were screens of fifty cubits, their ten columns and their ten sockets. The hooks of the columns and their bands were of silver, and for the east side eastward fifty cubits, fifteen cubits of screens on the one side were their three columns and their three sockets, and fifteen cubits of screens the other side of the courtyard gate, on this side and that side were their three columns and their three sockets. All the screens of the courtyard all around were of work, fine woven linen, and the sockets for the columns were of bronze. The hooks of the columns and their bands were of silver, and the overlay of their tops was of silver. And all the columns of the courtyard had bands of silver, and the working and the covering for the gates of the courtyard was the work of an embroiderer of blue and purple and scarlet material, and of fine woven linen and twenty cubits long, and the height along its width was five cubits corresponding to the screens of the courtyard. And the columns were four, and their sockets of bronze four. Their hooks were of silver, and the overlay of their tops and their bands was of silver. And all the pegs of the dwelling place and of the courtyard all around were of bronze. Okay, so Carol's saying they both represent the presence of Yahweh together with the Ark. The, the Ark of the Covenant is, is not void of the Keravim that are on it because it was made at two ends of the Keravim. It was made one with the Ark. And so the lid of atonement that goes on it, it represents the authority, the mercy seat. 
um, the throne of Yahweh. And as a picture, when we see what Yeshiyahu saw when he was given a vision into the heavens and saw Yahweh seated on his throne in Yeshiyahu 6, he saw the Kerovim constantly going around Yahweh, declaring set apart, set apart, set apart Yahweh of hosts. We see that same vision that Yochanan got in Chazon, where he again saw the Kerovim going around the presence of Yahweh, and he also saw the 24 elders and the thrones that they had and how they bowed down and how it was continually declaring uh, um, the presence, the set-apartness of who Yahweh is. So that's what the Ark of the Covenant represents. It was always a reminder. So even when it was being carried on the shoulders of the priest, it would be a reflection of that which is in heaven, let it be done here on earth. It would always be a reminder. That's why the booth of David is a restoration of praise a proper worship unto the Yahweh, not just with our lips, but our actions and our lives, mm. laying down our lives so that we can represent who he is. So to answer the lid of atonement and the two cherubim is all part of the Ark of the Covenant. The lid of atonement is that represents again the covering over the Ark so nobody would look inside because it protects us. Because if we look into the Yahweh's presence, we spoke about that last week, no man can see Yahweh's face and live. So it represents again the covering protection that gives us access into his presence to see him for who he is but not be destroyed because his blood that covers that mercy seat gives us access that we can come boldly to his throne of favor in our time of need. When you think about when Yahweh kicked Adam and Chava out of the garden and put the messenger with, the with sword, swords, yes. to stop them from coming in. Yes. In fact, if you... It's, again, the protection of coming into Yahweh's presence, you can only come in to eternal life in yes. the right way. Yes. And he protects his presence and our lives by putting messengers, cherubim around yes. yeah. to guard the situation. Right yeah. Well, it's like exactly that access back. And the only way we can come into him is by his blood. That was the, and even on the curtain, of the dwelling place, it was embroidered with cherubim to remind us the picture of what's going on around Yahweh's throne in the heavens. Because when we're reminded of these cherubim that had wings and were continually declaring his set apartness, we're reminded of not being found to be worthy of death because we've approached him in a wrong manner. Messengers are there. I mean, it's a picture of how it is. In yes. The messengers are there to do his bidding. Yes. Towards him and us. Yeah. yeah. So this last chapter we've just read now is obviously the, the the slaughter place of ascending offering. That was the bronze slaughter place that we see a powerful picture. As as we've gone through the tabernacle, again, please look at the notes and you see all the little pictures that I've done there, it helps understand a bit better. But in your mind's eye, if you, well, in your mind's eye, in your normal eye, if you go to the back of your scriptures and you look at the tabernacle, okay, and you'll see a couple of pictures there to help you get a bit of understanding. Um, we're going to get to the encampments at the, the back page there of the drawings when we get to Bamitba. But on the back page of this layout of the encampments, you've got like a little few blocks and everything else you I just want you to highlight from the, the east side where Moshe and Aharon are, are encamped. You, picture it in your mind's eye. For those that are online, I'm not showing you pictures right now. Or if you have your scriptures, look in the back of it because it helps you understand everything that we've been doing. Even as next week when we close Shemot, it should, it should be a natural picture that comes in your eye, in your mind, in your eye, so that you are able to have greater understanding and clarity as to what the design represents. So we come to the east gate or the door of the courtyard, okay? And it represents that which is also seen in the vision of Yechezkel as the east gate, which only Yeshua can open. And it's opened on the Shabbat and on the day he chooses, his appointed times, etc. Because he is the gate, he is the door for the sheep. And it's only by him that we're able to enter in. Now, when we come in and we come in that gate because we've gained access through our immersion in him, we come past the slaughter place and we're reminded to be a daily living offering. Okay, because that's a picture again. His offering himself up for us has given us the ability to be a daily living offering so that we offer up proper slaughter offerings of praise. 
okay? And in order to do that properly and approach him, we then pass that and we come to the bronze laver, which was where the water was put in, the priests would take water from and wash their hands and feet before they do service in the set-apart place. The bronze laver was made from the bronze that was used to uh, be used in the mirrors that the woman used at the door of the tent of meeting. So it's a picture again of looking intently into the word and allowing the word to wash us so that we don't forget what we look like. So that when we come into Yahweh's presence, we're coming in cleansed, pure, having been washed, but keeping our feet clean and working the works of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Then we come into the set-apart place, and on the left, as we came in to the south side, we would see the menorah representing that which we are to be, the light of our master's presence and keeping the lamp burning continually, and our responsibility for all of us to bring oil of pressed olives. In other words, we all have a responsibility of bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And looking then, bringing that in collectively, when we come together and it shines light on the showbread table, it reminds us every week we get the the freshness of his Torah. It's not an old word that's boring. We get the life of his word every week as we come to break the bread of our master's word sitting at his table causing us to be a people that are reminded of our duty to continually be praying without ceasing, as Shoal says in Thessalonians. That is seen as you're looking at the showbread table, but then look ahead toward the screen before the most set-apart place is the, the golden slaughter place of incense, representing the prayers of the set-apart ones. But now when we see this pattern, while there was a veil between the two, in the master that veil is taken away. We now have fullness of revelation of who our Savior is. Mm. As we can see in a type, his presence being with us, as it is in heaven, let it be done here on earth. So we gain access into being able to bring our worship unto him as a pleasing offering of praise, coming before his throne, making our requests known to him by the blood of Yeshua Messiah, not by the blood of bulls and goats, because only once a year did the high priest put blood on the bronze slaughter place, on the horns of the slaughter place, pour it out of the side and take blood as well of the bulls and goats on Yom Kippur and put it on the horns of the golden incense altar. And then by doing that, he would go in past the veil with the censer, sense, the, yeah, the golden censer, so that he would not be destroyed. Now, by the blood of Messiah, we have access in our time of need. But we don't just come into him any which way we go. We still understand the pattern. I've been washed. I've had an immersion. I keep myself clean. I'm being a daily living offering. I'm keeping my work and my walk clean through the word that I look into intently and meditate on day and night. I partake in the appointed times of the master. I don't neglect the gathering of the set apart ones. That's what gives me full access to his very mercy seat. And so when we understand this pattern and its function and form, Without this, we are unable to draw near to the master and understand what his blood truly has done for us, which we'll speak about after lunch in Hebrews 9. Okay, so if you look at that, you kind of see little blocks, but it helps you get the pattern, you know. And then obviously looking at the artist's impressions, you see the menorah, you see the showbread table, the slaughter place of incense, the slaughter place of burnt offering, you see the bronze laver laver and the ark of the witness, you know. So you kind of get an idea of what it looked like, because we can, in our mind, picture these things. Because as I said, the Hebraic language is a verbal language, but it's also picture language, if you will. Because when the master would say, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he will say, it's like this tree, or it's like this, or it's like this mountain, it's like that, it's like the mustard seed. So the hearer can apply that hearing to a proper understanding by able to visualize the words that are being spoken and not see this as something as strange, but seeing the practicality that needs to be worked out in its design to perfection of set apartness. I hope that makes sense. Rush through the design of the tabernacle, but it, it, it helps us put this train of thought into perspective that why are we going through this? So it becomes natural to us, you know, And just one of the corrections that you must make in your pictures at the back of your scriptures, please, in terms of the tabernacle, is that the court, in the illustrations, the first one of the illustrations, um, it's not boards of acacia wood overlaid with gold that was on the tent 
of the tabernacle, the outer courtyard, they are fine linen. But the boards of acacia would overlaid with gold are part of the dwelling place. So they've just kind of made the arrow too short. Yeah, the border of the tabernacle, which was the fine linen, is not boards, it's linen. But the dwelling place within the tabernacle, which contains the set-apart and the most set-apart place, that is boards overlaid with gold. So if you want, you can either change the writing there or just make your arrow go all the way longer because you can't see the boards because it's all covered. Okay, just a small little thing. Yes, in the other picture of the priest at the laver, that is incorrect because he, or, or look, he, unless he's got a vessel in his hands and he's taking water out with the vessel, because there were vessels made to take water out of the laver, he didn't wash his hands in the laver, because then it would make all the water dirty, which we spoke about last week or the week before. So just sharing that with you, because, you know, people go through and think, oh, Shemot, oh, it's boring. Oh, that's, no, it's not boring. It's, in, it's critically exciting. <laughs> Of how it looks where you are. Yes. When, and when our master taught us the pattern on which we should pray, it's not a recital of words that you think, okay, I've done the recital, I've known my lines, and I, you know, I can get my certificate now. It's a pattern. As it is in the heavens, let it be done here on earth. Moshe was shown, exactly, do exactly according to the pattern that it was shown you on the mountain. So we have. The pattern of his tabernacle, it helps us understand who we are in the master. And in type, metaphorically speaking, we can identify ourselves with individual parts in the master and also collectively of the whole. Because we all understand our need to be secure in the master through the tent peg. We also understand that the ropes, the, the you know, no part is without use. We also understand the tenon joints that can't be seen. Joining together, knitting together. Ephesians says that we are knit together, you know, like the, what's it, every joint and every ligament, you know, the ligaments that join the muscle to the bones. Those things, you don't see that, but when it's out of joint, you feel it. And you become almost incapacitated from doing work when a ligament is injured. <laughs> So it shows when everything isn't exactly working according to its function, it can't function. So when we learn this pattern, we apply it to our lives in a spiritual level, remembering that all of this was always about who we are in the one who sits on high. Okay, we're going to go for lunch. Before lunch, any, any comments, any encouragements, those that are online? Uh, Carol's saying amen and amen, thank you. You know, and as I said, there's no assumption and no question not worthy of bringing forward in order to grow in our understanding. Okay, let's pray. Master Yahweh, we thank you that it's by your word that you've given us the ability to assemble before you in today's readings, Vayakal, and he assembles. It's through Moshe that you've given us the ability through the words that you spoke to him and that he wrote down for us still being a living word today by your spirit, giving us the ability to assemble and be in your presence. And I hope today that the understanding of what it means to be in your presence is made more clearer in the word that you've given us, the pattern that you lay before us and the instructions for righteous living that you give us to live in order to see you, to know you, to walk with you, and to proclaim the praises of you who has called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Your word has called us to be perfect as you are perfect in the heavens. We can never achieve that perfection without your pattern, without our ability to be assembled in your presence, which you've given us by the blood of Messiah. We thank you upon this confession of who you are. You will continue to build us up as a set-apart dwelling place where we are able to continue to offer up slaughter offerings of praise as it is in the heavens, continually declaring your esteem, your set-apartness, your loving commitment that endures forever. Master Yahweh, we bless you, and I pray as we learn every week how to assemble according to your Torah, that we be a people who are busy giving our all and building your tabernacle, remaining completely pure and built up in you through the clear instructions that equip us to serve with great joy keeping our garments pure and set apart. 
and being that fragrance of Messiah in every place. In the name of Yahushua, we bless you. We thank you that even as we're looking at this design, that as we partake of lunch, we thank you for your provision as we sit at your table, not only to eat physical food, but having that hidden manner be known to, made known to us. We praise you, our provider, Yahweh Yireh. Amen and Amen. Amen.